Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research established this research center, which is the Petroleum Research Center, with the aim to make it a regionally recognized center of excellence uh, in both upstream and downstream technologies. The main purpose of this center actually is to serve the oil sector and to be the R&D arm uh, uh, you know, of the petroleum uh, industry in Kuwait. It has a foundation. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first in the region. It was started in 1967. So it has uh, a fairly amount of maturation. The development of technologies in different areas is a continuous process. Why you develop every time? Because there is a need, there is a requirement, there is a way that you have to find a cost-effectiveness uh, technology, uh, impressed technology which can fulfill your requirement. There is enormous challenges uh, that the petroleum industry uh, is facing. And those uh, challenges definitely need innovative answers. We are concentrating on how to improve the reserved oil in, in the country. How, uh, how we can probably develop technologies to improve the, uh, the recovery. In this center, we have five types of programs. Each program is focused in one area in the field. First program we call it enhance or recovery. Enhance or recovery means their work is totally with the upstream. The reservoir is the more uh, complex part of the earth geology and as we go to deeper and more difficult oil we need more understanding. This way we will enhance our capability of producing at lower costs. If we develop a technology which has to do related to enhance oil recovery, increasing the production. Uh, this technology, of course, can be used in any other country, in the GCC countries or in the world, uh, based on how much effective is this technology. Another two programs, we call one of them optimization refining processes, and we have a refining capacity flexibility. These two programs under the uh, downstream process. This program particularly deals with the hydro processing. Hydro processing means you treat the petroleum fraction in the presence of the catalyst and the hydrogen. We uh, have a number of patents related to the spin catalyst in, where, in which we try to develop a technology to recover the metals as well as to reuse this, uh, this spin catalyst. This can be used everywhere if it is acceptable and then commercialized. We are very good in catalysis monitoring. Also, we have now for producing the catalyst as well, we're preparing of the catalyst evaluation, and also we are doing it in our labs. We have here a very a unique lab. We call it pilot plant, which is simplified from the refinery. We try to align our research activities with the requirement needed by KNPC and at the same time, uh, having this facility, which, which I'm talking now here, uh, is give us the opportunity, because this considered a small refinery, which is mimicking the real refinery. It's operational 24 hours. So if we target a certain specific product, so we can make a full study, giving the results upon the completion of the results, giving it to, to the client, namely KNPC, there is a, a great potential to they use it on the commercial units. It's important because uh, the, the refinery and all the technology are changing with the years, okay, in order to take account of the environment. Uh, but more you take account of the environment, you reduce the gain of the refinery. You have to maintain your gain and uh, respecting the environment. Because of this, we are developing this technology that they are taking account all these elements. Petroleum refining, you are processing specific uh, feedstock, but this is feedstock's also properties is changing, so you need to develop catalyst. As the property changes, the sulfur content, for example, the sulfur content is increasing. So what technology that you have to use in order to reduce the sulfur, to be accepted? Uh, great to be back uh, here in uh, Istanbul and uh, 
I'm actually looking forward to introducing our panel today, and, and it's actually very rare to have so many established refining, chemicals, uh, trading, uh, and downstream representatives on one stage, and I will introduce the team as I come to the end of my speech. But before I do that, I, I actually wanted to start by telling you a, a little bit of a, a story. And, and it's a story I heard recently. Uh, so a few months ago, a Croatian businessman decided to take the, a road trip, uh, a road trip from uh, Istanbul to the north of Norway and back again. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, that, that's a round trip of 10,000 kilometers. And um, he, he chose to do that uh, just to prove he could. But what made this challenge, I think, particularly special is that uh, his car was a battery electric Tesla. Now, he actually described himself uh, before that journey as a little bit of a masochist for even attempting to do the journey. Uh, and it was not always easy. I think he would be the first to admit that, but he did it. And Given the, the range of concerns uh, around electric cars, I think you'd all agree with me that this could be considered to be a very big achievement. And actually, this, this story of this Croatian businessman reminds me of somebody called Bertha Bentz. Now, her husband was actually Carl Bentz, who was the founder of Daimler. And she took her husband's prototype car on a 180 kilometer round trip without asking him. Now, firstly, taking your husband's car without asking him is, is something I think that needs a degree of courage. But it was an even greater feat because there were no gasoline pumps at that time. In fact, she had to fill up at pharmacies because they were the only places at that time where you could buy gasoline. So it was the first long distance journey in a motor car. And history has proved that this was definitely a very big achievement. So a lot of has really changed in the world since Mrs. Benz took that road trip. And there's a lot more change happening in the world right now. I'm sure you'd all agree with that there is a global energy transition underway, and battery electric cars are actually just one part of that global transition. The world has to undergo this transition if it has to meet the energy needs of a growing population, at the same time as rapidly reducing its carbon emissions. As this growing population improves its living standards, there is no doubt that the energy demand will also rise. But we're here today to discuss about what does this mean for refining and what does this mean for the petrochemicals business. And whilst nobody, including myself, can forecast with certainty the, the, the future pace of change and its impact on demand, I believe there is a bright future for, in both areas. And so let me spend a little bit of time uh, explaining why. With petrochemicals, that's actually quite easy because demand for petrochemicals is growing. Uh, it's up to an average of about 3.7% each year in the last 15 years. So people want petrochemicals. In fact, some would say that they need petrochemicals. And in fact, you know, some of these products, such as insulation for buildings, whether you live in a hot climate or a cold climate, you can see contribute to reducing our energy consumption. But also, many of the chemicals that we are producing today are helping to produce lighter vehicles, lighter aircraft, to improve the energy efficiency of transportation. So for us, chemicals is part of contributing to that energy transition and reduce carbon footprint. And these are the strong fundamentals as to why Shell considers the chemicals business to be a strategic growth priority. And this means Shell is investing. It's investing right now in a company to, uh, to build the fourth 
lin largest linear alpha olefins unit in Geismar in Louisiana. Uh, so we shall are building that. It will be an expansion of 425,000 tons per year capacity. And this will make the shell site in Geismar the world's largest alpha olefins producer. And for those of you who say, well, what do we use alpha olefins for? These are the things that are in detergents and your low temperature washing powders that I know all of you will be using at home. The second area where we're expanding is with our partner, uh, Sinook, uh, where Shell is expanding the facility that we have in Dia Bay in China. And the new ethylene cracker and ethylene derivatives unit will increase our ethylene capacity by more than a million tons per year, and that's almost doubling our current capacity. Shell will also be building a new petrochemicals complex near Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania in the US, and I was actually there 10 days ago to see the, the progress with the construction on that facility, and that will produce 1.6 million tons per annum of polyethylene uh, once it's up and running. That's chemicals. So what about refining and the transport fuel that it produces? Has that Croatian businessman now shown that the battery electric vehicle is, has finally arrived? Can there really be a bright future for refining? And I believe yes. Yes, there can be. For a start, to misquote Mark Twain, reports of the death of the internal combustion engine have been greatly exaggerated. That trip that Bertha Benz took happened in 1988, actually, and it took decades before the motor car became truly global. So would that Tesla trip that I referred to earlier, would it be able to happen by traversing Asia, South America, Africa? Not yet, probably. Today, there are about a billion cars on the road, and about two million of them are electric. So that's two million out of one billion. But by 2040, the IEA believes there will be two billion cars on the road, doubling today's number, and about 150 million of them will be electric. So that's a jump in electric cars in, in the car fleet from under 0.2% to 7.5%. So that leaves about 92% which are fueled by other fuels. But there are trucks, there are ships, there are jet planes, and none of these can be sustainably today powered on electrons. That doesn't mean to say they won't be in the future, but that's where we sit today. So it's not just petrochemicals that the world needs. It needs gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. It needs refineries. And on top of that, most petrochemical facilities, but not all of them, but most of them themselves need refineries to operate and get feedstock from. So let me stress this is not a reason to be complacent. We can especially never be complacent over things like safety. And Shell knows its products have to be cost competitive and socially acceptable in a world that needs to cut its carbon emissions. To address this, Shell has at least three main focuses. And this is true, I would say, of both refining and petrochemicals. Firstly, the full integration of our operations to ensure that refining, chemicals, and the trading arm all work exceptionally closely together. This maximizes the, the returns and the cash that we can extract from that business. Secondly, we need to reduce our own operational carbon intensity. Now, this is not a simple job, as my colleagues sitting here today will know. But managing carbon intensity actually has become a part of the scorecard that determines Shell employee bonuses. And for the avoidance of doubt, that includes mine as well. Thirdly, by using the opportunities of digitalization to strip out costs and be more efficient and streamline our manufacturing processes, I think is critically important. And I'm sure that you'll hear lots uh, about these areas and more from our panel shortly. 
In fact, um, I'm so looking forward to, to hearing the perspectives. I think now is, is the time to introduce uh, our panel members. But before I do that, there's just one final point I'd like to share with you. Carl Bentz died in 1929, more than 40 years after his wife famously borrowed his car. When he died, cars with combustion engines were still facing competition, actually, from ste steam-powered vehicles. So yes, the world is changing. Yes, the world is changing rapidly. But global change does take, take time. And in that time, there is much that our industry and my industry can do and should do to get in shape. And to do that, it really has to focus and be intent on reducing the carbon intensity. And it also has to do that to secure its future and to ensure that we can continue to provide low-cost transportation and low-cost energy to those in the world who need it. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Um, I'd now like to say, uh, introduce the panel. Uh, each of them will speak for uh, about 10 minutes, so we'll have our stopwatches out for that. And uh, after that, we'll be opening up to questions from yourselves. So whilst our panelists are speaking, please start to think about questions in your own mind that you'd either like to ask myself or the panel members. Uh, so firstly, uh, we'll hear from Bernard uh, Pinatel, who is the uh, president of refining and chemicals at Total. After that, uh, he'll hand over to Pedro Miro, who is the vice chairman and CEO of SEPSA. The third to speak will be Bakit Al Rashidi, who is uh, the president of Kuwait Petroleum International. And finally, somebody who is uh, a deep friend of Turkey and uh, of course, is Turkish himself, uh, uh, Tufan Ergin Bilgik, uh, CEO of the downstream of BP, who will give his own perspective. So, Bernard, can I ask you in the first instance to, to share your thoughts? Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to share with you uh, Total's uh, view on strategies for refining and uh, petrochemicals. It's clear that the downstream business results attract more attention uh, since a few years, uh, since the, uh, the oil price drop, obviously, and I'm sure like many of you, I was recently questioned by some investors about our growth strategy in downstream, and the questions were very basic. They were telling me, you know, Total has delivered in 2016 a very good return on capital employ, more, more than 30% uh, post-tax. So that's the top of the industry. Why don't you allocate more of your resources to refining and petrochemicals? That's the kind of question you like to have and the challenge we are all uh, looking for. But I'm sure you all also all remember that downstream uh, has been challenged in the past. And uh, when we look at strategies for refining and petrochemicals, we need to have memories because we are operating in a very cyclical uh, industry. And strategy, as you all know, is about making choices, very specific choices to make sure to win on the marketplace and to be different. And what I would like to, to do in the next few minutes is to bring you through uh, the choices that Total has made over the last five years in its downstream uh, business. Actually, since 2012, when we decided to merge refining and chemicals, we chose to operate as two different uh, divisions, reporting to diff two different VPs. And we decided five years ago to physically merge these two divisions into one single reporting line with behind a strong belief that we would create value. And this value has been uh, created by leveraging three uh, levers or three clear choices we have made, which I'm going to bring you through uh, in the next minutes. The first choice we made has been clearly to leverage integration between refining and petrochemicals. The second choice we clearly made has been to focus on our petrochemical uh, business line and to grow it through uh, differentiated fixed stocks, uh, uh, namely uh, ethane and, uh, and LPGs, the Atlantic feedstocks, 
And the third choice we made has been to uh, deliver this strategy through partnerships. I really think these three words, integration, advantage fixed stocks, and uh, partnership is the winning combination. It has been the winning combination for Total over the last five years, and I'm sure it will remain a winning combination for the years to come. So let me first start with integration. When I talk about integration, I think about industrial integration platforms, not just, you know, uh, playing along a value chain, but basically operating on one single site assets, industrial assets. Because we clearly believe that the most robust refineries are the ones which are integrated downstream with crackers and with pet chems in general. It's true when it comes to maximize, obviously, uh, synergies in terms of feedstock. It's, it's true, of course, when it comes to uh, improve uh, energy efficiency or to reduce costs. It's also true uh, if you want to benefit from very competitive capex because you may play the brownfield investment type of capex. And it's also true because you rely on an integrated management team. So people who are incentivized on uh, looking for the asset global optimum and not trying to, to figure out how to optim optimize local ones. Over the last five years, uh, we have made this choice and total uh, strategy has been to concentrate on a few world-class uh, platforms. We have six of them in the world. I'm not going to name, of course, all of them. But I would like to take just as an example the last investment we've made in Antwerp, in Belgium, which is uh, one of our largest uh, integrated platforms. It's, it's a 350,000 barrels a day refinery integrated with two crackers and some uh, polymer lines. And we have just completed a $1 billion investment to modernize this platform. And one part of this project has been to recover our refinery of gas and use them as a feedstock in our cracker to replace NAFTA. So it's a good example of a, of a benefit of integration. The second choice, as I said, uh, has been to make or to grow our petro petrochemical business by leveraging advantage feedstocks, namely the gas, ethane, and LPGs. First, why to focus on PetCam? I'm not going to repeat what John uh, just told us a few minutes ago. We all understand that the growth in the years to come is going to come from polymers, growing uh, well above GDP. So it's pretty obvious that when you build your strategy, you try to grab the growth where it is, and that's in petrochemicals, in polymers. We are also all aware that the shale gas revolution in the US has, is a game changer and that the cheap ethane price gives a decisive advantage when it comes to producing ethylene as derivatives compared to NAFTA. We all know that in the next 10 years, in North America, ethylene production will grow by 40%, and the share of ethane-based production will be close to 80%, which is a big difference compared, for example, to Europe. And on a worldwide basis, we estimate that 50% of the additional ethylene capacity that will come on stream will also be based on ethane. But ethane is just that, uh, gas is not just a feedstock, it's also uh, an important competitive advantage when it comes uh, to talk about cost of energy, both for refining and petrochemicals. And that's why we clearly think that the US and Middle East are going to be the best places to invest in petrochemicals and that's the choice Total has made. And that's why, for example, recently we announced in last, in last, in last March uh, the investment in a second cracker in Port Arthur in Texas, a 1 million ton ethane cracker. Uh, it's a 1.7 billion uh, dollars investment. The third choice we've made, as I said, is to grow through partnerships. And these are not just words. We believe in partnerships, and I would even say it's part of Total's DNA. To be more specific, I'm not sure you are all aware of that, but 100% of our non-European platforms are today funded on joint ventures. We have one in the US with BSF, 60-40, to operate a steam cracker in Port Arthur. In Korea, we enjoy a very successful partnership with ANWA, it's a 50-50 GV, where we operate one of Asia's best-in-class integrated platform, again. In the Middle East, as you all know, Total has been a pioneer, establishing a joint venture in Qatar uh, for uh, decades to produce olefin and polymers. And most recently, 
We have partnered in a GV with Saudi Aramco and started up a world-class refinery platform in Jubail. It's a 400,000 uh, barrels a day uh, refinery. So you see we have plenty of uh, examples of how to partner because we think that in the years to come, building partnership will be more than ever critical, notably in the field of technology and in the know-how management. And I just would like to maybe to give you one example of each. In the technology, I think about the low carbon solutions to address the climate change challenge. Innovating in low carbon solution creates opportunities. This is what we have done through a GV in biopolymer, uh, in bio-based polymer through a GV with Corbion to produce, for example, polylactic acid in Thailand. In the management, I would like maybe to take as a and how it will impact the way we operate assets tomorrow. To address this challenge, Total has transformed a former refinery into a new training center, we call it Oleum, where we train future operators on real installations and we train them to this new operating mode through the digital revolution. And just to give you an order of magnitude, just last year we trained close to 2,000 people on this uh, Oleum Training Center, most of them coming from uh, outside partners. So in conclusion, in a very cyclical environment, again, I strongly believe that the winning combination is gonna be integration, leveraging advantage feedstock on Petchem, and building partnerships. And the bet best example is gonna be my last one uh, of this winning combination is our recently announced a joint venture project in Texas, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. We are partnering with Borealis and Nova to invest in this uh, one million ton a year uh, ethane cracker, and we're also investing downstream in, in, on polymer lines. And here you have a perfect combination. We leverage the integration of Total in Power uh, to make a very cost competitive capex. Just keep in mind that one million ton of uh, ethane for 1.7 billion dollars of capex, it's one of the most competitive capex of the US Gold Coast. You, you can do the benchmark. We are getting access, of course, to the ethane and a very uh, competitive access to, to, to feedstock, basically. And we build a win win partnership. Total brings the upstream integration. Borelis will bring its Borstar technology in the US. And Nova complements Total's market share in North America. Thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to leave the floor to Pedro. Thanks, uh, John and Bernard, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Let me start with a disclaimer. A few days ago, uh, John organized a conference call in order to split a little bit the job and what we should say, what we should talk. And uh, I was supposed, or I was in charge to talk about the Mediterranean zone, refining on the Mediterranean area. Uh, Honestly, I think that it's quite difficult to be so specific, so probably I'm going to be uh, not so specific. And also when you talk second or third, you will start to realize that probably you are repeating a few things. So I will try to split this present, uh, speech on two parts, talking first about a few challenges we are facing, and then um, finalizing with uh, some of the remedies, some of the ideas uh, we may have in order, to in order to tackle these challenges. Let's start with a challenge. First one, I think that there is no doubt that we are facing a failing demand. A failing demand that of course is not, is not even, is quite uh, diverse, different, depending on the different zones of the Mediterranean area. Of course, that fall is more acute uh, on the northern part, on the northern rim, but it's quite clear on the whole zone. 
And this is especially clear when we look in the Western part. If you consider Italy, France, Spain, in 2015, we represented over 40% of the demand of petroleum products on that zone. By 2030, we are supposed to represent approximately 30, or slightly a little bit more than 30%. So a big change. A demand that, of course, has suffered a lot to the big economic crisis, that is recovering a little bit due to the weak economic recovery in the zone, but in some way contracted by the transition to the low carbon economies, to the whole energy saving policies in all this area. The second big issue, the second big challenge, is the increased competition from refiners outside of that region. Some has been mentioned previously, especially by Bernard. The big, the huge Middle East refining capacity additions, which is exporting products to our areas, is quite clear that the Middle East will continue adding more capacity, building on adding more value to their products, to their crudes, and benefiting from very specific situations in terms of cost, on transfer prices. But this is not the unique thread that we have. The modernization program on the Russian refineries with a very adaptable fiscal regime, or of course, the US refineries on the Atlantic Basin with very low energy cost and all the benefits coming from the shale oil. The third challenge would be extremely heterogeneous environmental legislation with completely different rules from the northern and the southern rim. And even if we take a look in the northern rim, where we are clearly overregulated, we see heterogeneous in that area. Take Spain just as an example. In my country, with several, several community regions, with several autonomous regions, every autonomous region has a different environmental regulation. The environmental rules that Tufan is facing in his Castellón refinery are completely different than the ones that we are suffering in the Andalusian refineries. The fourth challenge will be the geopolitical turmoil in the northern Africa, particularly on the Near East as well as in the North African part in Egypt and Libya, where the flow of products and the consumptions has changed quite a lot. And the final challenge that we see is rationalization, or better said, the slowdown on the rationalization that we have to consider if we take into account the erosion on the demand. Unfortunately, at least on the northern part in Europe, nobody is accountable for this. And we think that there is a serial issue. We don't have a meeting like the Japanese that we may like or dislike, but they dictate the rules in which this rationalization has to take place. And if we consider all the environmental rules, all the energy saving rules, the erosion on the market, rationalization is a must. So having covered some of the challenges, which could be the remedies? What can we do? First of all, technology. Technology has helped us in the past. Technology and innovation will help us in the future. Standardization is an obligation. We have to avoid too much tailor-made. We have to avoid over-design if we want to keep control on the capex. Partnership has already been mentioned. Partnership with our suppliers, with all the contractors, with the EPC contractors, to make sure that we have the optimum from the cost-benefit point of view in our new investments. The second remedy, petrochemical integration, already been mentioned too. We are obsessed 
about molecular management. If we can add more value to any molecule as a chemical, why we should burn it? There are many options. Some of them has been mentioned before by John. I will talk about the slightly different one. May sound similar. LAB, no LAO. Also a product that ends up in a soap is the largest surfactant. And we at SEPSA are building and debottlenecking the LUB plant that we have in Algeciras. In fact, the largest plant in the world to produce LAB. We think that the integration that in the past has been mainly considered as an integration between refineries and retailing has to be interpreted in a slightly different way, giving more value to the whole value chain and especially giving more value to all of the molecules that we have from a chemical point of view. The third remedy, digital transformation. And of course, we have to admit that we as refiners have a strong analogic accent. But having said that, we also have to consider that we have introduced digital systems long time ago but that there is room for improvement. We have plenty of data. We have plenty of sensors in all of our units, getting terabytes of information every day. Can we process them in a better way in order to obtain more useful information? Or even in a more simple way. We used to have operators who would walk it talkies everywhere. How are going to be our future operators? Still with the walkie-talkie or with something else that will allow them to be more proactive from a decision point of view? Be safer, be more productive. No doubt that the digital transformation also is going to affect us in a positive way. And last but not least, a strict cost, of con cost control. We have done this. We have been obliged to be strict on cost control. But I have the feeling that our colleagues from the upstream part have done, probably because they were obliged, a better work than what we have done. We have to be sustainable on all the savings that we have observed. So let me just finalize here. All in all, there is no doubt that we have plenty of challenges in front of us. But I think that at least in this part of the world, on the Mediterranean zone, the refining people, we have the skills, we have the systems, we have the experience, we have proved that we are resilient, and I'm sure that we will prove once again, at least on a short and medium term. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for the invitation. It's certainly an honor and a pleasure to speak at such a prestigious event. Today, uh, I would like to shed light in global and Middle East downstream industry, in addition to its challenges and opportunities that would reshape its future, of course. As we all know, in recent years, many factors had a major impact on refining business. The first one is the oil price volatility for the last three years, which has created uncertainty, whereas both the producer and the consumers are waiting for crude oil market to rebalance. Current refining capacity has crossed 97 million barrels per day capacity, 
refiners have enjoyed healthy margin where most of the upstream sector has struggled since summer 2014. Global demand for distillates and chemicals continue to grow, supported by low price environment. Demand for oil increased around 1.6 million barrels per day during 2015 and 2016, crossing 96 million barrels per day, mainly supported by high demand or high growth in India and Middle East. In near future, China and India would count for more than 75% of Asia oil demand growth. This is equivalent to around 45% of the global demand increase. Whereas in other countries like Brazil, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Vietnam, oil demand growth will be around 25% of a global increase. If we add this to India and China, we'll have about 70% of additional global oil demand will be from those seven developing countries. In refining industries or industry, new projects will continue to move from west to east, Asia and Middle East would keep constructing new grassroots refineries, integrated and big in scale. From now until 2040, worldwide refining capacity would touch 110 million barrels per day, moving from 97 today to 110. This is additional 13 million barrels per day. The expected increase would be mainly from Asia, which is around 9 million barrels per day refining capacity, and Middle East with 3.3 million barrels per day. At the same time, several small, simple refineries in Europe and other OECD countries, especially or mainly Asia Pacific, would undergo slowdown shutdowns or permanent conversion to terminals. It would be due to inability to meet either environmental regulations or an ability to compete with giant modern and more efficient new refining complexes. As we speak, more than 20 refineries are likely to face similar challenge of closure with total capacity of around 6.5 million barrels per day by 2025 in the same region as per the latest forecast. Moving to Middle East, today this dynamic region accounts for around one-tenth of global oil demand and the current growth rate is above 3%. And actual refining throughput is touching 9 million barrels per day. And refining throughput is forecasted to grow further by to about 10 million barrels per day by 2025. And it might reach 12 million by 2035. Out of that volume, only 55% will be consumed locally within the Middle East and the rest will be exported to the international market. There are currently around 52 refineries in Middle East with a total capacity, as I said, of 9 million barrels per day. And by 2019, Saudi Arabia would have added around 1.2 million barrels per day with the new projects in Sator, Yasrif, and Jezan refinery. United Arab Emirates has recently commissioned Ruiz refinery expansion, making Ruiz refinery the biggest in the region with a capacity of 840,000 barrels per day. 
The condensate splitting capacity is also expected to expand it along with higher integration or higher level of integration with petrochemicals. And by 2040 Middle East, refinery additions are expected to be over 26% of total global expansion. This is equivalent to a new refinery commissioned each year from now, of course, until 2040. Uh, in line with demand trend, refining, refinery product yield will undergo a major shift and hydrocracking technology will be used to upgrade sour medium crude for high quality middle distillate products and the light distillate and middle distillate combined yield will increase to around 85% by mid-2030, whereas residual fuel oil will decline by 2020 to less than 15%, and at a longer term will be declined further to less than 10%. Thereby, Middle East will continue to be a next, next exporter for almost every major refined product in short and long term. The gradual subsidy removal and freeing up energy market is progressing well in the Middle East as part of reforms. The subsidy reduction in Bahrain, Kuwait, and price increase of petroleum products in Saudi Arabia, and freeing the fuel prices in United Arab Emirates and Oman are recent examples. Focusing in Kuwait, strategic initiatives. Kuwait Petroleum Corporation, KBC, has planned for an increase in crude production from current level of 3 million to 4 million by 2020, and they will sustain that level until 2030, and this will also increase from 2030 from 3 or 4 million to around 4.7 by 20. 40, and Kuwait domestic refining capacity will increase with that to 1.4 within the next three years. This would be through revamping the existing complex uh, and commissioning also a grassroots refinery, a Zor refinery with a capacity of 615,000 barrels per day along with petrochemical integration. And along with that capacity, the local consumption for petroleum products in Kuwait is only 300,000 barrels per day, and the rest of 1.4 million will be exported to the international market, and it will be meeting the most stringent quality east or west. And outside Kuwait, we are planning to build new refineries in the high growth region. First example is the Nagisan refinery in Vietnam. This refinery is uh, 200,000 barrels per day, integrated with a petrochemical complex, and is targeting the local demand in Vietnam. And we are now commissioning that refinery, and we hope to end the commissioning process and start producing products before the end of this year. The Dugum Refinery Grassroot Project in Oman is another JV between KBI and Oman Oil. And now we are about to start the construction stage. And we are expecting this refinery to be on stream the end of 2020. And some other projects or, let's say, opportunities in Indonesia and Philippines and also India are on our radar, mainly due to their first growing or fast growing demand, thereby the total refining capacity outside Kuwait will be reaching 800,000 barrels per day by 2020, and we are hoping to increase that to 1.3 million by 2040. To conclude, I would like to summarize 
that after current oil price volatility, we expect the balance to return to the crude oil market and product markets also from current oversupply position. Hydrocarbons will continue to dominate and by 2040, the full fuel mix will still have more than 50% of world's energy supplies from oil and natural gas. Simultaneously, there, there would be a continual rise of the renewables demand and low carbon solutions. Oil demand would be shifting from west to east, making a new refinery location inside demand zone a strategic choice. And Middle East will continue exporting both crude oil and products beside gradual removal of subsidy from now until 2040 at least. And I'm very optimistic that the healthy refining margin would encourage investment in mega projects for expansions or grassroots refineries in the high growth area that are integrated, of course, with petrochemicals. I believe also refining would truly remain as the backbone of any industrialized region. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for your participation and wishing you a very fruitful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Istanbul is a good venue for these discussions, not just because it's my home city. A lot is happening here that reflects the big global energy trends. I want to spend a few minutes on those main trends first as we see them in BP. And then I will talk about what I think this means for refining and petrochemical strategies. The main trend is that energy demand is going up. I think we all expect that. In BP, we think the most likely path will be around 30% higher demand for primary energy by 2035. That means growth for both refined products and petrochemicals. How to take advantage of that growth depends on how you position yourself. On the demand side, there are multiple trends to be aware of in geography, in low carbon, in policy. Geographically, almost all the increase in demand is going to come from fast growing economies in the East, from China in particular and India as well. We expect 2.3 billion cars and trucks on the road by 2035, nearly double the number today. Air traffic is doubling over the next 20 years, with demand for aviation fuel going up at 1.5% a year. And petrochemicals demand has been growing above GDP since 2010, and we expect that to continue. Together, these trends are contributing to an extra 15 million barrels a day of liquids demand in 2035 by our forecast, met by refined products, petrochemicals, feedstocks, and bio. That figure would be significantly higher without the damping effects of efficiency gains and the transition to lower carbon. Engines, processes, buildings are getting more efficient. Products are getting more fuel efficient. The bio content in products and feedstocks is increasing. All of which contribute to lower carbon emissions. And a different aspect of environmental policy 
is emissions from ships. With new regulations coming into force, reducing the sulfur content of fuel oil. I think we can expect to see this having an impact on crude and product differentials as we get closer to the 2020 implementation deadline. Those are all the trends on the demand side. On the supply side, there are two big trends to mention. The first is the location of feedstock supply growth. As we are seeing in North America, we have US light tight oil and NGLs and Canadian heavy crude all growing. This has an impact on feedstock costs in two ways. On crude differentials for refining and on feedstock choices for petrochemicals. The second supply trend is where manufacturing investment is being made. Most new refining capacity is being built in the Middle East and Asia close to demand growth, while new petrochemicals capacity is mixed with capacity being built in the US and Middle East close to feedstock supply and in Asia and specifically China close to the demand growth. Both of these are having an impact on trade flows and will increasingly do so. One further trend, and probably the biggest, is the pace at which technology and digitization is advancing, transforming production, demand, manufacturing, marketing, and consumer behavior. So those are the main trends. What about the strategic considerations that arise from those trends? There are three I want to mention very briefly. The first is feedstocks. In refining, we continue to see a feedstock advantage for North American refining runs through growth in US light tight oil and Canadian heavy. And this is enabling them to export product competitively. In terms of new investment in refining, this is mainly concentrated east of Suez, closer to centers of demand growth, taking us to a world where over 50% of refining runs will be in the Middle East and Asia by 2030. In the case of Middle East, this refining capacity is close to growing crude production and is competitive for supplying product into Europe. In petrochemicals, the investment options include feedstock considerations such as NGLs in the US against LPGs, NAFTA, coal, and others in Asia, with technology advantages a part of that consideration. We see the demand growth for, growth for final petrochemicals products mainly in Asia. So you also have the integration of midstream and trading capability to consider a part of that choice to locate near to feedstocks or near to demand centers. The second big strategic consideration we see is the low carbon transition. In fuels and petrochemicals, there is a big role to play in advancing this transition. As well as improving energy efficiency in our operations, in BP, we already have a whole range of products that are lower carbon, either by being more fuel efficient or having more biocontent in feedstocks or final products, or through offsetting where we have over 10 years expertise. Our high street example is our ultimate fuels with active technology, which significantly improves fuel efficiency. And in aviation, we have taken a leading position in biojet. We were the first in putting biojet direct into the fueling system 
which we are doing at Oslo Airport, and we are investing in a biofuel startup in the US that is turning solid waste from cities into low carbon aviation fuel. We are also interested in biopolymers and biopolyesters and getting more biofeedstocks into our refineries. Reducing the sulfur content in marine fuel oil is driven by a different environmental concern and likely to have an impact on crude differentials and relative value of products. This may offer an opportunity if you have the capability and agility to optimize. The third key strategic consideration is technology and digitization and how you use this capability. A good technology example is our purified teraphthalic acid PTA technology. Compared with conventional technology, our plant in Zhuhai in China produces 65% lower greenhouse gas emissions as well as 75% lower water discharge and 95% lower solid waste. We use this technology to produce a low carbon PT air brand, which has environmental benefits and also gives us a cost advantage over conventional technologies. I'm going to single out digitization as the really transformational force in the years ahead. And we are really focused on that. For planning and monitoring the progress of maintenance and turnarounds, for inspections and remote monitoring where we are already using drones, for improving personal safety by improving awareness of where our people are and what they are doing, and for predictive analytics to improve reliability and anticipating the issues before they become problems. The ambition is to be a fully data-enabled business where we can access, report, develop insights faster and seamlessly without the need for manual in intervention or the generation of reports. This is an area of rapid change with much more on the way, and we are only just beginning to see and realize the possibilities. To sum up, the fundamentals of the downstream environment are changing faster than any, at any time I can recall. That includes changes in supply and demand, in consumer preferences, and the low carbon transition, and with the influence and possibilities from technology and digital. While demand for our products is rising, the environment for both refining and petrochemicals remains challenging. So we want, we need it to be highly competitive. In refining, that means having top quartile net cash margin capability, which is where we are now in BP. In petrochemicals, which is cyclical, resilience comes from reducing the cash break even, and we are doing that. We expect our cash break even to be 40% lower next year compared to 2014. So I believe there are real opportunities to be successful. But you need certain qualities. You have to be highly competitive and able to maintain high performance. You have to have the right capabilities in your people and in technology. And you have to be agile to react and adapt at speed given the pace of change. Put all these together in the right order to match the strengths of your business and you have a strategy for success. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much indeed to uh, all the panelists there. I think you've heard, uh, in some respects, uh, slightly different perspectives on refining uh, chemicals and uh, into the downstream business, uh, but also quite some overlap there. So uh, it's now over to you for the next 20, 25 minutes. So we're keen to hear questions from the floor on any topics that you uh, have heard or maybe have not heard. And uh, if you would like to direct your question to any specific uh, panel member or myself, uh, please do that. Uh, on the front row here. I guess we have a roving mic. Here it comes. Hello? Oh, right. Yeah, Sorry. that's it. One, one quick thing is, is all gentlemen have very carefully avoided the issue of diesel and where the life of diesel is going forward. Um, certainly in the UK, we're having a big backlash against diesel fuels in cities like London, and they're going to start banning it over the next few years. Um, we'd be interested to know about what your colleagues would think about where the life of diesel is going forward, because I mean, I think the engines are not coping with the requirements for NOx emissions and they're going to start removing this in London uh, from now over, over the years. They're going to start avoiding vehicles coming into London. And the same, I think, has happened in Mexico and a few other places. So if you've got a new refinery, which I know is part of the world, being slated as very heavily for diesel, it would be very interesting to know what your colleagues would think about where diesel goes from here. Tufan, would you like to offer an initial response on that? Yes, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I think... I totally understand the challenge, but there is some misunderstanding on this because only if you look at globally, only 15% of diesel actually goes to passenger cars. The rest of distillate pool and diesel goes to other places, not to mention obviously truck transportation, but other things as well. So we are actually talking about 15% globally. When you live in Europe, uh, you think because it, Europe is mostly diesel cars and it is the only continent actually with that characteristics, if you think about it, you think this is the end of diesel. But actually, our forecast suggests uh, distillate pool will grow more than the gasoline pool going forward for simple reason that most of the actually diesel doesn't go to passenger cars. Second thing is, I, in my speech, I touched on marine fuel sort of specifications. There are lots of scenarios you can write on, on that, but potentially, potentially that will increase the demand on the distillate pool. So, so I think that's another lens. Therefore, we actually see in our forecast, distillate pool will grow more than the gasoline pool. Thanks, Tufan. We had a question here in the, the middle. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Mie Gairola from Mall Hungary. I would ask about propylene. What happens to the propylene and propylene derivatives because there will be lack of propylene and on-purpose propylene? What, what's your opinion about that? And then final provocative question, when polypropylene will be more expensive than polyethylene because of this reason? Anybody want to cast a view on propylene? Yeah. But, uh, uh, let's take it by region, maybe it's easier. Uh, it's clear that if you take Europe, where 80% of the uh, cracker is still NAFTA based, there will still be enough uh, propylene from the, from the downstream of crackers, even if some not tend to now switch to ethane or LPG. So I don't see that as being a big, uh, a big issue, knowing, as you probably know, that there have been now a few announcements made on uh, a couple of PDH in, in Europe to come. So basically, we see in Europe the market being balanced as it is today, coping with the growth. So I don't see there uh, much of a challenge. The question is, of course, more for the US, where more crackers, gonna, as I said, uh, are going to switch to ethane. And we estimate that 80% of the crackers in the US are going to be uh, ethane-based. And of course, it shortens, by definition, the, the C3 stream. 
And there, uh, of course, your uh, question may be very legitimate, but you see also that there are some uh, projects, projects at that stage in, in PDH as well. I think out of my head, there are six of them, which are more or less, in, you know, in uh, not, not really, uh, which have not been sanctioned yet, but people are thinking about that because they understand that the market is going be, to be, become tight at one stage and they will need to rebalance. So from that standpoint, I don't see uh, much of an issue. Uh, on Asia, uh, you all know that uh, we anticipate China to be uh, self-sufficient uh, in, uh, in propylene by uh, 21, 22. So it's going to be again uh, a story uh, which uh, should stay balanced. And to uh, answer to your questions about uh, is polypropylene going to be more expensive than PE? Honestly, I have no clue. <laughs> and it's like the price of oil and chemicals in general. You don't dare to make any bet. So I, I, I have no clue, honestly. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, question here at the, in the front row. I'm Shinoy from Hindustan Petroleum India. My question was, uh, while we're looking at electric vehicle as competition, and you mentioned that uh, it'll take only 3% and 2% of the vehicle population, uh, have we actually factored in global warming and those issues that can happen faster, and you can have interventions from regulatory authorities and governments to accelerate that? I didn't see a mention or a concern on that front from any of the speakers. Could somebody throw a light on that? Yeah, m maybe I'll uh, offer a, a few responses around electric vehicles. So uh, certainly I, th I think you're absolutely right that nobody should be complacent. And uh, it is one thing looking at global averages of 0.2% or 7.5%. Uh, but the reality is that it, some of the solutions will undoubtedly be uh, very country specific. Uh, and I think that is one thing as we go through the energy transition. Uh, th there will not be a necessarily a global solution. There will be many country solutions depending on whether you have a prevalence for, of wind or sun or hydro or biofuels or whatever. So I, I think that's certainly uh, very important to understand. The, the, the second thing is I think all of my colleagues would agree that, that many of us are already today preparing ourselves for that transition because the transition has started. So I, I can only talk as the leader of Shell's downstream that um, we, we've already opened a uh, hydrogen fueling station uh, in the UK at Cobham on the M25. We've got more coming this year. Uh, we'll have 10 electrical vehicle charging stations in the UK, 10 or 20 in the Netherlands. Uh, liquefied natural gas for uh, transport, particularly on the heavy trucks and also in the marine area uh, are areas where I think all of us are, are developing those options and, and you heard uh, Tufan also talk about biofuels. So uh, the reality is, is do not be complacent. Some countries will undoubtedly go a lot faster than others. And in many respects, I, I, I think you are right that the pace will be determined by a number of things. Federal regulation, state or provincial regulation depending where you're sitting, but also the pace of innovation and technology because ultimately the, the market will also decide at which pace they want to go relative to the solutions on offer. Our intention is to provide a range of products and let the customer choose. On the front row, another one. Mina Marafi from Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, Petroleum Research Center. My question is actually to Mr. Uh, Rashidi, or maybe to also Binatel. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there is a project already which we completed in the refinery uh, in Vietnam. And the same thing, I think, in Kuwait, we are also uh, in progress of finalizing the Azur refinery. And there is an integration of petrochemical uh, with that refinery. Can you tell us exactly what it, uh, you are going to focus on as a product for the integration? Because it's not clear exactly what will be the role of that refinery when we talk about the integration. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, 
We believe that the future of refining business is an integration with petrochemical. And when we say petrochemical as refiners, uh, usually we talk about the first line of petrochemicals, olefins, aromatics, and these type of uh, products. We are not going down to the specialities, but we feel in future also the second line or third line also might enter the defense of the refinery. And today, we all know that the refining business is a cyclic business. Sometimes the margin is high, and sometimes it's low. And vitrochemical is the same. By having the, an integrated uh, a complex, you can at least minimize the effect of this cyclic uh, uh, issue. Uh, this is one. Second, today, nobody go for, let's say, a vitrochemical standalone, mainly to cut cost in the, uh, uh, in the complex and to ensure that you will be able to compete with the other uh, competitors. Uh, unless there is a special area like what's happening in the United States right now, but in the Middle East and in the East, I think the integration between refining and first line of petrochemical would be the trend for the future. Thank you. Nice question. Uh, at the back, yes. Uh, I am Sri Ganesh from uh, Hindustan Petroleum Research uh, and Research Center. Uh, my question is to the panel on the marine fuel specification, how the industry is going to uh, resolve it. The technology is there, but I don't think the bunker industry will be able to uh, bear the cost of desulfurization of the uh, bunker fuel to meet the Marpol specifications. In which direction this will go? That's a question that is on the mind of uh, all of us. So who, who would like to offer some first views on, on the IMO specification? Tifan? I, I can offer it, John, but I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball to answer that question. But I, what I would say is there is a myth out there which suggests industry cannot cope with this demand, which is not true. Our industry can, all our work suggests our industry can meet this demand. So therefore, I, I, think, I think that meet is, is not actually correct. Uh, what is likely to happen, probably you will expect some uh, crude slate changes in some refineries, depending on their capability. And you are also likely to see some distillate pool growth and actually some light uh, sort of sulfur, uh, low sulfur fuel oil to go into that pool as well. Our projections suggest we can actually meet the demand. That's not the issue. I know your question is about shipping industry, but I think supply will be there and hopefully it is at a cost which is affordable. But yeah, and, and just to add that, I think Tufan is absolutely right, but the, the, the marine industry will have to make some choices. You know, do, do they switch to uh, a scrubber? And if so, you know, are there the ballasting facilities in port to, uh, to discharge the, uh, the, the, the contaminated water? Uh, some of them indeed will choose to go to LNG. You know, that, that will depend upon the availability of LNG in, in some of the major, major shipping hubs like Singapore, etc. cetera. Um, in, indeed, some will, will go to, to lighter distillates. So um, these are also choices which um, the, the industry itself will, will have to make. And the, the other question that is on my mind is, is how efficient and effective will the member states be in regulating uh, the legislation once it is brought through. So thank you for your question. I'm, I'm not sure we have all of the answers, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of, of uh, some of our thinking and some of the multi-dimensions to this particular uh, challenge. Yeah, uh, Pedro, yes. Uh, if, you, if you allow me to add something to this topic, uh, um, I think that bit following with what John was saying about really who is accountable really and we have seen that just the working group of the IMO last week uh, decided on a couple of subjects one 
how we split or the accountability amongst the, uh, the, the vessel, the owner, the charterer, or and the, and the full supplier. And as well, they have established a waiver in terms of the, the, bust, the, the ballasting policies. So probably uh, timing and how everything is going to be applied and who is accountable is going to be a real issue. Thank you. Yes, we have another question in the middle. I would ask for a totally different angle from the human capital point of view that how do you see in these coming strategies the availability of competent people from an attraction and retention point of view to our industry? Uh, yes, maybe I would like uh, to share with you uh, Total's experience, which, which I, f I think is not true just for downstream, but which has been also true for upstream. You know, when the, the oil price uh, dropped uh, f three years back now, uh, the first reaction of many of uh, the oil and gas companies has been to, to uh, launch massive uh, layoff plans. And uh, you have seen it in the, in the U.S. Gulf Coast, of course, but you have seen it uh, all across the world. The, the, the choice we made at Total has been a little bit different. Uh, basically, we, have, we haven't made any uh, layoffs, but we have just frozen recruitments and we have just played, you know, the, with a natural retirement which has put, of course, a lot of uh, tension on the, uh, on the team, on the, on, the, on the people internally. But we were convinced that it was the right thing to do because when the, we felt that the, the environment would, uh, would come better, uh, because we are, once again, as I said, working on a very cyclical environment, when price uh, would come back, and that's the case today with 50, uh, 50 plus, uh, we would be uh, well prepared to, you know, to grab uh, because we will have uh, the competencies uh, still in-house and so on. So what has been done in upstream has been true as well for, for downstream, honestly. So we have uh, adapted the workforce, but we still have kept all the competencies to make sure that we, we don't, uh, once again, weaken uh, what makes, the, of course, the, the wealth of a company, the, the expertise of the, of the people. So it's a little share of experience. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the clock now, and so it's probably time where I use the last five minutes just to, to, to wrap up and uh, summarize uh, for you uh, what I've heard. Um, and, and I must admit, as a leader of Shell's downstream, I, I recognize all of the uh, challenges that I've heard in your questions, and I recognize all of the challenges uh, that my colleagues have reported out in, in their speeches. So firstly, thanks very much indeed to, to the, the panel. And secondly, thank you to all of you for your questions. I think what you have heard is, is, a, is a very strong view that the demand for energy is increasing. I think we all know that. Uh, very much driven by the demand in the developing countries, whether it be China, India, Indonesia, uh, and you know very much as well that um, transportation and, and the need for transportation and fuels for transportation is, is, is very much driving that. You know, one billion cars today, over two billion cars going forward to, to 2040. And indeed, therefore, I think in the transportation sector, all types of fuel will be required. And we as uh, energy providers will, will be incumbent upon us to provide those fuels for the customers. Uh, I think you heard as well Tufan talk about uh, supply and uh, supply growth and where that will come from will be very important. It will, will impact indeed on uh, crude differentials and uh, refiners of course take very close attention to crude differentials because that in many respects is a big component of our profitability but on the chemical side as well it will give us access to those advantage feedstocks. On chemicals, I think you heard a, a unanimous view that the demand for chemicals will grow at or above uh, GDP levels. Uh, very much, I would say, fueled by the increased wealth in society and people coming into the middle income bracket, but not least uh, fueled by the energy transition because those lighter materials and substitution for steel, whether it be in aircraft, whether it be in cars, uh, or whether indeed it's insulation in vehicle, in, in, in buildings, uh, all are a driver to grow that demand for chemicals. I think there is no doubt from all of us that uh, chemicals can and should exist where there is an advantage feedstock position, 
whether that comes from a refinery, whether it comes because you're sitting on a gas field because there's surplus gas. And um, those are the key components I heard around chemicals. For refining, again, we, we heard because of the increased demand for energy, there will be an increased demand on refined products. But w this is a very different story depending on where you're sitting. We, we heard, I think if you're in the Middle East, you know, a very positive view on uh, demand for refining and refining capacity. If you're sitting in the Mediterranean, it's a slightly different story. Um, so uh, where you are in the world, I think uh, is, it's going to feel very different if you're owning a refinery, depending upon the size of that refinery and, and also its, its competitiveness, with most of the growth being in the, the Middle East and Asia. You know, therefore, I think that, you know, irrespective, cost control will be in critically important. You know, refining uh, has always been, uh, I've been in this business for 36 years, a, a business of low margins. And, uh, but cost control and cost discipline, I think, will, will continue to be in, important. Uh, but, but also, as well, we heard of the importance of integration. I think that word came out many times, whether it's integration between refining and trading, refining and chemicals, downstream and midstream and upstream. Again, a, a significant uh, in factor in terms of competitiveness. And, and delivery of cash from our downstream businesses. Now, you know, when we talk about cost control, I think we also heard many messages around digitization, uh, being more efficient, being more effective, and, and the role of digitization, whether it be through drones or, or technology within our refineries, is, is very important in terms of improving safety, improving efficiency, and also improving competitiveness. And so, digitization, innovation, technology, automation, where of course the, uh, the car industry is, is, is probably a very good uh, guiding light in terms of the automation of the business, uh, is, is I think important in all of our minds. But of course, many of your questions and some of our comments turn to the environmental challenge. And that will impact us in many forms and shapes. It will impact us because our customers make different choices, whether it's for electric vehicles, whether it's for hydrogen vehicles, LNG vehicles, or uh, uh, cars that are taking biofuels. So we should not underestimate the choices of our customers. We should not underestimate um, the forces of regulation, which, as we discussed, could be very country specific. But also, you know, we have a moral imperative as uh, operators of refinery and chemicals and many of us marketing businesses to provide um, those um, uh, fuels that, that we can offer to the customers, but also to reduce the emissions from our manufacturing facilities. And I think, last but by no means least, and it is very important, I heard the word people coming up, whether it was partnerships, that came in very strongly through Bernard's session in terms of the importance of partnerships within companies, but also partnerships with our suppliers uh, in, in order to ensure cost-effective provision of uh, goods and services. And so there is no doubt as leaders of refining and chemicals and downstream business on this panel today that we need to embrace all of those factors as we go forward. And my sense is, is that if we do embrace those factors, we can be the custodians still of, of very competitive businesses, but acknowledging the energy transition has started already. So thank you once again, and uh, thanks for your attention. The Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research established this research center, which is the Petroleum Research Center, with the aim to make it a regionally recognized center of excellence uh, in both upstream and downstream technologies. The main purpose of this center actually is to serve the oil sector and to be the R&D arm uh, uh, you know, of the petroleum 
industry in Kuwait? It has a foundation. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first in the region. It was started in 1967. So it has uh, a fairly amount of maturation. The development of technologies in different areas is a continuous process. Why you develop every time? Because there is a need, there is a requirement, there is a way that you have to find a cost-effectiveness uh, technology, uh, impressed technology which can fulfill your requirement. There is enormous challenges uh, that the petroleum industry uh, is facing. And those uh, challenges definitely need innovative answers. We are concentrating on how to improve the reserved oil in, in the country. How, uh, how we can probably develop technologies to improve the, uh, the recovery. In this center, we have five type of programs. Each program is focused in one area in the field. First program we call it enhance or recovery. Enhance or recovery means their work is totally with the upstream. The reservoir is the more uh, complex part of the earth geology and as we go to deeper and more difficult oil we need more understanding. This way we will enhance our capability of producing at lower costs. If we develop a technology which has to do related to enhance oil recovery, increasing the production. Uh, this technology, of course, can be used in any other country, in the GCC countries or in the world, uh, based on how much effective is this technology. Another two programs, we call one of them optimization refining processes, and we have a refining capacity, flexibility. These two programs under the uh, downstream process. This program particularly deals with the hydro processing. Hydro processing means you treat the petroleum fraction in the presence of the catalyst and the hydrogen. We uh, have a number of patents related to the spin catalyst in, where, in which we try to develop a technology to recover the metals as well as to reuse this, uh, this spin catalyst. This can be used everywhere if it is acceptable and then commercialized. We are very good in catalysis monitoring. Also, we have now for producing the catalyst as well. We preparing of the catalyst evaluation and also we are doing it in our labs. We have here a very a unique lab. We call it pilot plant, which is simplified from the refinery. We try to align our research activities with the requirement needed by KNPC and at the same time, uh, having this facility, which, which I'm talking now here, uh, is give us the opportunity because this consider a small refinery, which is mimicking the real refinery. It's operational 24 hours. So if we target a certain specific product, so we can make a full study, giving the results upon the completion of the results, giving it to, to the client, namely KNPC, there is a, a great potential to the use it on the commercial units. It's important because uh, the, the refinery and all the technology are changing with the years, okay, in order to take account of the environment. Uh, but more you take account of the environment, you reduce the gain of the refinery. You have to maintain your gain uh, respecting the environment. Because of this, we are developing this technology that they are taking account of all these elements. Petroleum refining, you are processing specific uh, feedstock, but this is feedstock also properties is changing. So you need to develop catalyst. As the property changes, the sulfur content, for example, the sulfur content is increasing. So what technology that you have to use in order to reduce the sulfur to be accepted uh, worldwide so the people they can buy your, your uh, commodity or your product which is meeting the uh, international standards. So the demand for technology development is always there. Fourth one, which is the corrosion, corrosion assessment and mitigation. And here it's falling into two areas, which is downstream and upstream, and to prevent any kind of failures happens in the future. Cost of corrosion for the oil industry is in millions. 
Imagine a simple failure in a refinery, a crack in a vessel or a pipe or a reactor. It means for the refinery shutdown of a unit and uh, they take several days to change the uh, damaged uh, piece of equipment. So you lose production for several days. The last one, which will be petrochemicals. In our program, we are focused on enhancing the product properties. And we are focusing as well on trying to engineer high performance uh, polymers. In these two solutions, we can help the, the, the sector to be more competitive in comparison with the market and international market products. There are many, many technologies worldwide, but uh, which technology would suit uh, the reservoir that you have? Imagine in, uh, in, uh, not only each country has uh, its own uh, oil uh, properties, but each well, each well, they, it has its own characteristics. So in this case, you have to really look into technology to produce what we call it, this type of uh, crude oil, which is under category of non-conventional oil recovery. That's why we introduced the improved oil recovery, the enhanced oil recovery, to produce the heavier feedstock. We're also uh, responsible to have uh, staff to be well-skilled and trained, Kuwaiti staff in particular, also having students from university, from public authority, to, to having their, uh, for example, their thesis or something like that. So we, we work collaboratively with those uh, affiliation in order to, uh, to end up with high caliber uh, staff that can, can not only be used at Kisar but also in the oil sector. We have to really be ready and confident in, in, in our research projects that we conduct and uh, also uh, to be highly recognized and acknowledged uh, uh, for, for the science and technology and innovation uh, locally, regionally and internationally. I think the needs require such institute to exist not only in Kuwait and the region but all over the world because energy uh, is uh, one of the main factors that uh, impact uh, sustainability. We have a fantastic team, we have a marvelous equipment under one roof, so it is a really a platform to start directional uh, research in all kinds. The vision is clear now, uh, based on the, this close relationship that we have, now it's getting more and clearer and clearer to us exactly how to, where to focus and how to probably achieve these, uh, these uh, plans that we, we set. ARCTIX is a collaboration project uh, involving six universities, four research institutes and eight oil companies in Norway. And our aim and goal is to understand the petroleum resources of the Arctic, uh, how to develop the best possible technology that suits the Arctic, which has the least possible environmental impact. The research is mainly uh, divided into three. So three intertwined projects. One is to understand the Arctic geology, we're dealing with uh, petroleum geology and exploration of the Barents Shelf, so of course, geology is a very crucial and important component. I've been working with several different projects and different aspects of, uh, of sedimentation in, in uh, Svalbard and the Barents Sea. But particularly, I've been focusing on the paleogene succession that were deposited 60 million years ago in uh, what they call the central basin of uh, Spitsbergen. So I think this basin is a good analog to some of the basins that you find uh, along the western Barents Shelf margin. Here you can see there's a layer in the rocks that is a bit darker here. And across the fault you see that this block here has gone down on the other side of the fault. Here you have a layer of sediments here that is thicker where the fault has moved down. So you had some space to deposit more sediments. Of course when it comes to exploration, uh, 
having Svalbard as an uplifted part of the subsurface is very important because then we can use this as an analog to the stratigraphy that the companies are working with in the, in the southern part of the Barents Sea. The other one is to understand the environmental impact of our activities. We operate with ecosystem-based management in the, this region of the world, and that means it's a balance of protecting the environment, but also utilizing the resources that exist there. And that is a big challenge because you have to bring all the stakeholders to the table, you have to communicate the risks, and you have to come up with solutions and manage the future development activities. And the final component is a focus on marine mammals because marine mammals are you know, at the top of the food web in the Arctic. They're very much associated with sea ice, so we spend a lot, we have a very strong focus on marine mammals uh, in the program. Marine ecology is an important part of uh, ArcX because um, we want to work sustainable and uh, we need to understand the ecosystem. In case something happens, then we need to understand which um, consequences it can have for the ecosystem. And the third is to develop the best possible eco-friendly technology that is suitable in these vulnerable areas. We are taking part in other projects that use new technology to collect data and analyze data. So of course that's the link between kind of old school conventional geology being out in the field is easily combined with uh, new technology. We also uh, do some technology projects where we develop uh, drone technology for use in these areas uh, and that requires special uh, infrastructure. I use drones or unmanned aerial vehicles to look at um, marine mammals, uh, more specifically whales. They fly in uh, using waypoints, uh, following a set path that we design in a computer with the help of Nordut. And then every three or four seconds, they take a picture. And then I look to see if there is a whale there or not, and look at the quality of that picture to see how certain I am and what are the light conditions. It's essentially is to test how, how good these tools are because uh, the use of these systems is, is quite recent and it's been developing really fast. So um, having this for marine mammals, it removes almost completely having the observation that you collect at sea and then goes away that nobody else can look at that. So you, then you have a recording that several people can, can see and uh, you can remove what's so-called as uh, the observer bias. The biggest resource we have in a program like this is the group of young people. We have a number of PhD students and postdocs based at universities, but they are also coupled to institutes. What I'll be doing is that I'll, I will investigate the source rock uh, properties of a uh, specific period, the Triassic period, and also next year we plan to go to Svalbard. Uh, and collect samples there as well. So we're also collecting samples in Bjorn And we will correlate that with wells which have been, which have been drilled in the Barents Sea. And we can see how these properties of the source rock uh, changes laterally. And then we can try to determine how the um, quality of the source rock is in terms of uh, hydrocarbon potential. We conduct many um field expeditions and, and research uh, expeditions uh, and we uh, it could be close by or it could be uh, trips that require the use of ships and the University of Tromsø has a research vessel that we use for that and then we have access to very good laboratories at several of the participating universities but also industry partners help us with their laboratories. So all in all, it's a, it's a complicated mix of different infrastructure that helps us to conduct the research and give the best possible results back to the participants. I don't know any other projects which brings all of these activities in, together into one project like this. Uh, and also the sheer volume and size of this project is such that we will have an impact. It's an eight-year uh, project in involving many partners. The cooperation between the academia, 
the government and the companies as uh, as cooperators is is very unique in a, a region setting at least. Uh, and the, the size of the project and the diversity is also very unique. It's a continuous process of improving the way we do things as new knowledge comes to the table. By getting communication going, we can actually we also get good information back from authorities that we can use to improve our research uh, programs. The ultimate delivery, I think, uh, is that we would have been very useful for uh, uh, the authorities, uh, for the oil companies, and for the research institutions and universities who are involved in the project. Uh, we will have educated about 30 PhD students and trained postdocs, uh, and we will have published uh, a set of good papers in the best journals. exploring the role of research for innovation in the petroleum industry. Um, I was thinking that last time there was a World Petroleum Congress in Moscow in June 2014, the R&D discussion might have been quite different. The Brent was just 109 up from 105, and since then we've been down in the 20s, and you know where it is right now. Uh, since this Congress met in Moscow, as Jürgen said this morning, the world of oil is split into short cycle and long cycle projects, which also must be a challenge for those responsible for research and development. Uh, the world has also more fully embraced climate change um, with all its implications for this industry. But also, and perhaps most important for this um, for this session is that um, since 2014 um, the world has come to realize an unprecedented technolo technological advances and opportunities. Everything driven by extreme computing power at very low costs. Supercomputers, as you know, enable artificial intelligence, autonomy, autonomous vehicles and vessels, and the Internet of Things. But it's also giving much stronger tools to further classic sciences such as chemistry and even physics, opening vast new opportunities, as we will hear a little bit about uh, this afternoon. And um, my experience is that the changes in technology that we're seeing right now forces rethinking of production processes, products, and reshuffling of value chain, including a huge trend from delivering a product to delivering a service. And this cuts across all industries. <clears throat> and we have a research and development panel at such times of change. Well, a research and development panel really becomes a strategy panel and a risk management panel in a way. You're talking about what you're going to do in the future. Uh, this session has invited uh, four impress or three impressive company executives and one professor to shed light on how they use R&D, news insights and technology to innovate in order to achieve cost competitiveness and access to enough resources, but also figuring out how to position your company in face of a climate constrained world. Let me introduce the panelists. Uh, Dr. Nasir Darman is the head of group research and technology of Petronas. He will speak first. Then Yuri Sebrecht is the executive vice president of innovation, R&D and CTO in Shell. Tom Schussler, president of ExxonMobil Upstream Research Company, and Dr. Wataru Ueda, who's professor at the Kanagawa University and former president of Japanese, uh, the Dra Japanese Petroleum Institute. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone from the supplier industry on this panel. Unf we had someone, but uh, for reasons unknown to me, he pulled out, and I think uh, the intriguing developments of new constellations, new operator-supplier relationships is actually very interesting for R&D. So if someone in the audience wants to take the word afterwards, I strongly encourage you to share your, your thoughts. Little bit about me. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Alexandra Bekiev. I'm the head of SINTEF, which is an independent research foundation in Norway. We have about 2,000 employees 
uh, we have a strong position in Norway, uh, and together with the Norwegian Institute, uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, we've had a role in most of the major breakthroughs in exploration and production on the Nor Norwegian shelf. You see the multi-phase flow loop, and you see a picture from the world's first projects uh, storing uh, carbon dioxide underground. Um, my background is as a lawyer. Uh, I have more than 15 years in senior management positions in Statoil and Norsk Hydro, including heading up the renewables and low carbon unit. Um, but perhaps as interesting is for 20 years almost, I've served on a number of company boards focusing partly on the energy, power and oil and gas industry, but also on the media space, which has been one of the first victims of digitalization. And I think that interplay gives me interesting perspectives. I was on the board of Technip from 2012 until the merger with FMC earlier this year. But I've also practiced as a lawyer, leading a number of public and private inquiries into crisis situations, including the 2011 terrorist attack in Norway. So I worked in the space between technology, strategy, policy making, and corporate governance, which is an interesting perspective to bring in to a research organization. As head of Sintef, I talk to executives across a lot of industries. And what I find striking is how the past couple of years, we see a much stronger focus on technology strategy than before at the board level of the companies and a shift from focusing solely on your own industry and its competitors to a huge openness from learning from other industries. Um, and I think that has shaped the way we think about strategy. Uh, as I say, uh, Sintef is uh, about 2,000 employees. We're multidisciplinary and multi-market. At the center of our strategy is a strong research group on enabling technologies, which is materials, chemistry, digital, which means sensors, connectivity, autonomy, artificial intelligence, etc., and industrial production. And we try to infuse those enabling technologies into the areas where Norway has a competitive advantage. And we've clustered it, as this picture shows, and the oil and gas industry is at the bottom, but it's actually a player in almost all the other fields. Uh, in renewable energy uh, and clean energy environment, it cuts across oil and gas, building and infrastructure, process industry, power industry. And we have centers for environmentally friendly energy, working from energy efficiency, zero emission neighborhoods, electric mobility and carbon capture and storage. In the ocean, ocean space technology, we have huge hydrodynamic labs working across maritime, offshore, aquaculture, harvesting new ocean-based resources such as algae and plankton. We try to bring industrial methods from, for example, the oil and gas industry into healthcare, multi-phase flow simulation in the heart, uh, but the biggest, of course, being a Norwegian company is the oil and gas related activity. We work from exploration to CO2 storage and plugging, including um, the largest multi-phase flow loop, as I said, in the world. We've been hard hit by downsizing uh, because of the cost cuts in the industry. But recently, we also see a booming demand for help on how to utilize uh, new digital technologies, including how the organization should adapt and the individual should adapt to using new digital tools to work across the entire value chain. I wanted to give this little presentation of my organization before allowing my colleagues to take the stage and talking about how they work on uh, innovation across their business uh, to further uh, a competitive uh, petroleum industry. Please, uh, the first speaker is um, uh, Nasir Darman from Petronas. Oops. There you go. All right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting Petronas and myself to this beautiful city of Istanbul. Uh, very glad to be here, enjoy myself very much. And the issues that we are talking in this panel session is basically the importance to demonstrate the importance of technology uh, or innovations uh, to, to the company. 
And let me try to answer that question from the very beginning of my first slide, the title of my presentation itself. Uh, to Petronas, uh, research uh, and innovations is basically being used to unlock new opportunities. There are many, many opportunities that we cannot grab before. There are many, many opportunities that we KIV in. We postpone the development of it. S excuse me, Nasir, I think we, we need to get the Petronas slides, please. The slides for Dr. Nasir Darman Petronas. I can see the slide just now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah, Save. that's correct. Okay. Uh, there, are, there are many opportunities that Petronas or, or we as an industry cannot exploit or cannot monetize last time. So technology is being used to basically unlock or open up the doors so that this thing can be, can be, can be monetized and, and make profit for the organization. And this is basically to ensure that we have a sustainable future as a company, as an environment, as a society in this, in this uh, beloved world. Yeah? Before I go through uh, to the details of what technology is, after I answer in the first slide, let me give you into perspective what is Petronas all about uh, in terms of composition of our manpower and also our business. Yeah. Uh, Petronas basically in terms of EMP explosion production operate in more than 20 countries all over the world uh, from Asia up to Southeast uh, Asia and then up to uh, Americas as well. In LNG, we exist in uh, Egypt, Australia, Malaysia, Canada, uh, and we are the biggest uh, retail leaders in Malaysia as well in South Africa. That is Petronas. We have about populations of staff slightly over 50,000, and about 10% of it, or roughly 10,000 of it, is basically expatriate and non Malaysian, uh, coming from 102 uh, nationalities. So you can see. Uh, how difficult to communicate in Petronas itself. <laughs> so it's just represent the world uh, to, to, to me, yeah? It's quite young organizations. Uh, majority of our people are a bit below 35 years old. Uh, and in terms of women workforce, uh, 28 to 30 percent are basically women. And, and nowadays, uh, women play a very important role uh, in our, even at management uh, level, the top management level of Petronas. In Petronas, we are quite simple organizations. We have upstream business and we have downstream business. Yeah? This, that is how Petronas is being structured. Uh, first, it's a guy who basically discovered the oil and up to the selling point. Uh, and, the guy, and the next guy is basically the guy downstream part that value add the whole things uh, uh, into, into the value change. And what is the role of technology in this case? Uh, for the upstream part, we basically play a role to add resource and reserve to the, to the organizations. We have a responsibility to make this, all the things that we cannot, ex we cannot found, we cannot develop before, to become commercially available to the company by adding up the reserve uh, and the resource. Yeah? I'm going to tell you in the next slide how we're going to do that. Second, in terms of uh, downstreams, we have a mission to differentiate ourselves. Uh, all these wells, Petronas Chemical, for example, are very into commodity products. We believe that we should run away from that uh, slowly and go to the niche uh, market or uh, chemical specialty uh, in that case. Yeah? And uh, going niche requires a lot of technology and that is what uh, our existence in terms of technology is all about for downstream. And for both upstream and downstream uh, cost uh, uh, cutting, cost reductions, cost compressions, uh, and efficiency improvement is a key. So it doesn't matter where we are uh, in, in Petronas, uh, efficiency improvement is always a main target. And we try to achieve that using technology as well.
Petronas Technology covers the whole spectrum of oil and gas. Uh, the nature of the business uh, that Petronas involved in is basically from explorations up to the retails. So we basically have the full spectrum of technology basically to support the business. Uh, it started offshore. Most of Malaysian operation, in fact, all of Malaysian operations are offshore. So we started with exploration. We need to see better than others. We need to improve our uh, exploration success uh, by threefold be before we can make our company uh, sustain in the in the in the future. Currently, our 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 possibility of uh, success is only about 20 to 25. Uh, it's going up now using a technology that we develop using seismic, a better processing technique, a better interpretation techniques that we, we, we plan to achieve more than 70% uh, success ratio. It sounds a little bit of uh, ambitious, but technology needs to start with a very ambitious goal. At least if we feel, we feel half. <laughs> yeah? So, so that, is, that is one. Second part, all the things that we have discovered, we are producing right now, in terms of oil, for example, we need to squeeze it until the last drop. Yeah, uh, we have uh, full teams uh, under uh, enhan enhanced oil recovery teams that is being designed to basically squeeze the oil until the last drop at $30 per barrel oil environment. So we put a very strong KPI for this team so that even at $30 per barrel, now we are about 50, 40 to 50, uh, even at $30 per barrel, we can still do EOR and recover that uh, oil using new technology that we are going to develop. The third one is that for the gas. Yeah? Uh, in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, uh, a lot of our gas, uh, sweet gas, is gone. Uh, we currently have developed it, produced it, uh, and make money from that. Uh, what is left is all high highly contaminated gas fields, yeah? Uh, in some of them are basically 70 and 80% of CO2, H2S, and all others. It's, it's, it's very tough. So the role of technology is to make sure that this type of gas can also be developed at the same cost that we are developing our sweet gas right now. Yeah? So we are basically have a mission to develop this contaminated gas at even $3 per mm BTU. Uh, pre-LNG market, yeah? pre-LNG plant uh, to, to that thing. So it's a very tall order that we have to uh, do and we have to do <laughs> things differently. In the case that we cannot solve uh, issues of stranded gas field, yeah? we have a lot of small gas fields that is far away from the current infrastructures. Uh, to put a pipeline is very expensive. Uh, to, to pipe it to shores for LNG or even to power is very expensive. We have a uh, very uh, bold vision uh, about five, six years ago that we min uh, miniaturize and also marinize our LNG plant and bring it offshore. So we built a first in the world floating LNG. Yeah? And in last year, end of last year, we have the first drop of LNG in that ship, and few months after that, we export the first cargo of LNG from our offshore plant, yeah, floating LNG. So that is how bold we are in terms of technology. Yes, we know it is very tall orders, but we believe it can be done, and we have demonstrated that in a floating LNG case. And then if we go uh, to uh, one of the things that we are basically talking about now is facilities of the future. Yeah? Uh, we believe in the future, we're basically talking about automation, we're talking about digitalizations, we're talking about advanced material, material that does not need repairs, does not need painting, does not need maintenance. Yeah? It's self-healing, even it's been corroded, it is self-healing itself. So this is what we, we believe, and we put up a, a program of what we call a facilities of the future with the visions to reduce our OPEX by 50% if we base it to 2016 cost. Yeah? 
So we are hoping in year 2025, we operate Petronas asset with 50 less uh, percent money compared to 2016. Again, it's tall order, but we believe uh, we, can, we can handle it. And then to support our business overseas, uh, in Canada, especially in Australia, uh, we put up a program to see uncon, unconventional assets. Yeah? Uh, we need to make sure that our asset is specifically <coughs> properly and become the first quartile uh, operator in that particular asset. Yeah? So we have a team that developing a technology to make sure our uncon uh, basically operate at very optimum uh, pace and also uh, uh, profit. Yeah? For downstream plants, uh, like I said, we are moving from commodity to niche. Uh, specialty chemical is our main target. So we have to develop something new, something more efficient, uh, something uh, uh, higher margin compared to what we are producing right now. And the last one that we are doing is a fluid solution. This is the team of people who bring the Mercedes car to win the last Formula One champion last week. Yeah. Sorry, guys, I beat both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, exactly, this is a team who formulate the fuel and lubricant. First, into the Formula One car, make sure that everything is works, and then we use the same technology for the road car, for and basically helping branding of our retail uh, business uh, to make sure that we transfer all the technology that we learn from a very advanced uh, technology area, Formula One, to our road car uh, in Malaysia and wherever we operate. So that is the role of technology that I'm, that I'm telling. And then uh, just to give you one example, this is a picture of our floating LNG. Uh, takes us about six, seven years uh, from ideas to uh, basically getting the first uh, uh, drops of LNG and basically this can be mobilized after that field has been finished we're going to mobilize it to other fields so that all the standard fields that we uh, can unlock can monetize before can be monetized now that is basically <coughs> the theme that I want to highlight in terms of Petronas unlocking the new potential for the company so that we can sustain our presence uh, in this industry or in the future. Uh, with that, thank you very much and thanks for your attention. Very good. Yuri, I think you're next. And could you bring up the shell slides, please? The first ones you put up. We'll just wait for that slide. We need the forward-looking statement, huh? Absolutely. Cannot start without it. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a privilege for me to be on this panel today and to discuss with you the topic of research and development, which I consider of paramount importance for a future that requires both more and cleaner energy. Before I start my short presentation, I need to draw your attention to this cautionary note. I know you are all fast readers, and you may have seen it before anyway, if you have attended any other Shell presentations. <clears throat> then on to the title of my presentation, R&D as a competitive and collaborative differentiator. Uh, my central thesis today is that R&D remains a key differentiator for any successful companies in the energy industry. Um, and that great industrial R&D is both competitive and collaborative at the same time, which may seem an internal contradiction. However, my point is that the ability to collaborate well without losing competitive differentiation is a competitive advantage in its own right. Energy plays a central role in enhancing the quality of life for people across the planet. However, addressing environmental stresses from air quality to climate change has never been more important. Simply put, the world needs much more energy to address developing needs, as well as 
far fewer emissions to address environmental concerns. Nobody can tell with certainty how these changes will happen or how fast. However, what is certain is that if the world is to achieve a lower carbon future, technology will be instrumental. At the same time, optimizing every facet of the value chain is needed as much as ever, but is no longer good enough to outperform competitors. Today, we compete in a world where firms that can build, manage, and widen their technology connections win. That takes a different set of skills. Today, competitive advantage is not only driven by the resources you control, but also the resources you can access. At Shell, we focus on both sets of skills, working competitively as well as collaborative. As an example, let's first look at the deep water business, where Shell has been a leading player for decades and where we have a firm intention to grow. In today's low oil price environment, Shell and the industry need to sharply reduce project execution cost. It takes large investments to develop new technologies, mature them, and then commercialize them. Even more importantly, in order for equipment suppliers to be able to meet the needs of developers and operators, industry standards must be developed and adhered to. It makes total sense to develop these large engineering solutions together in good collaboration. Take, for instance, subsea infrastructure of uh, trees, manifolds, flow lines, and risers. Shell has, has a long history of strong collaborative relationships with suppliers to develop solutions for these large engineering challenges. In the current environment of low oil prices, there's more innovation taking place, with the focus now shifting from making things possible for the first time to making things possible at a radically lower cost, typically by reducing size, weight, and complexity of equipment. Shell is working with several of the suppliers in shaping the innovation opportunities for our projects through systems engineering and design competitions. In this way, both operator and suppliers prevent price points for services and solutions that projects can no longer afford. And collaboration supports a competitive supplier landscape and thereby economically sustainable growth. I'd like to look at a second example and that's catalyzing practical action on climate change. As mentioned earlier, the world is going to have to meet rising energy demand. And at the same time, it needs to get to a state called net zero emissions. Net zero does not mean a world where there are no emissions. It means a world in which those sectors, such as steel making and aviation, that are unable to stop greenhouse gas emissions, are offset by other sectors, which are taking CO2 out of the environment. What can we, the energy industry, do to make this possible? Achieving it will involve a suite of technologies, including carbon capture and storage, commonly abbreviated as CCS. More than that, carbon capture and storage will need to be combined with sustainable use of biomass as a fuel to create a net negative impact on emissions. We are one of the 10 companies that have joined the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, an industry-driven initiative which aims to catalyze practical action on climate change through collaboration. This includes looking at pathways to CCS, aiming at developing a common position on the market mechanisms for CCS commercialization, and to determine how oil and gas companies could act to facilitate CCS development at scale. The members of the OGCI have committed collectively to invest $1 billion in innovation towards low carbon energy solutions over a decade. We expect our investments to have a considerable multiplier effect. This will come from partners investing alongside OGCI investments, as well as our own company's investment in deploying commercialized technologies. Another example of where collaboration is key to innovation is when common infrastructure needs to be built, such as in the case of hydrogen fuel cell mobility. Hydrogen electric transport can succeed if vehicle manufacturers and fuel suppliers, with support of governments, work together. 
there needs to be sufficient refueling infrastructure to attract customers to buying fuel cell electric cars. At the same time, there needs to be sufficient cars on the road to give businesses an incentive to build this infrastructure. This is why Shell is part of the H2 Mobility joint venture in Germany, jointly with five other industrial partners in automotive engineering, industrial gases and fuel retailing. We will build a nationwide network of hydrogen supply points for customers, enabling unrestricted mobility for owners of fuel cell cars throughout the country. Now with these examples, I may have given the impression that R&D is only about collaboration, but of course, it isn't. Competitive advantage also comes from strong proprietary technology developed in-house. In fact, a world-leading in-house R&D capability is a prerequisite for doing world-leading collaborative R&D, as it allows us to define the right research questions, attract the best collaboration partners, and assess the quality and applicability of the research results. A great example is our ethylene oxide technology, which we have continuously improved since the 1960s. Over time, we have grown the selectivity and stability of our proprietary catalyst technology, resulting in better yields and lower capital expenditure. We apply these technologies in our own EO projects and in our existing plants. And through our catalyst company, CRI, we offer this to our licensed customers. With a market for EO that continues to see attractive growth, this in-house developed technology gives us an important competitive advantage. Other examples of technologies that we continue to develop in-house are advanced algorithms for seismic imaging in complex geologies, advanced gas treating technologies with proprietary solvents and equipment design, and our world-leading gas to liquids process and catalyst systems. The previous examples all refer to shorter term R&D developments. Another part of Shell's R&D program focuses on longer term technology solutions. And we are stepping up our research program to address fundamental energy transition challenges in the field of advanced energy storage and future energy carriers. This research is all in a pre-competitive stage. That means longer and deeper collaborations with startups, academia, national labs, and research institutes, and actively investing in people. For instance, with the Dutch Research Institute for Fundamental Energy Research, DIFFER, we collaborate on energy solution based on plasma chemistry. Also in March of this year, we entered into a $25 million five-year research collaboration with the Energy Biosciences Institute at Berkeley University in California, with the objective to harness the power of renewable energy sources to develop the fuels of the future. And in our work with startups, we apply our entrepreneurial mindset, nurturing new businesses in the belief that some of them will prosper and grow. An example is our work with and investment in Kite Power Systems, a startup company that is developing high altitude wind power generation technology. In recap, our industry will require much innovation to meet the dual challenge of more and cleaner energy at a competitive cost level that attracts the capital required for growth. There is a place for in-house proprietary R&D as well as great value in collaborative R&D to unlock new opportunities. In fact, my belief is that the skill to collaborate efficiently is in itself a competitive strength and that a strong in-house R&D capability makes a company stronger in collaborating with other innovators. At Shell, we welcome the challenge, and together with many of you as partners, we will innovate to make the future. Thank you. Okay, Tom, are you ready? And we'll have the excellent slides. Well, Alexander, thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here in Istanbul, which has often been described as the crossroads of history. 
And I believe that that title is appropriate for today's discussion on research and on innovation. After all, the history of innovation is very much the story that defines our industry and one that provides the roadmap for our future. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes today discussing that history of innovation, both within our industry as well as my company at ExxonMobil. For the last 135 years, our company has led industry and pioneered innovations that have shaped the modern world. From refining kerosene for lighting the 19th century, to fueling the revolution in transportation and mobility in the 20th century, and to the pursuit of new energy solutions for a 21st century amid heightened environmental concerns. Now, there are many who think that the oil and natural gas industry has changed very little throughout its history that is hardly different than it was a century ago. But those in this room, we, we know better than that. Such a misguided view fundamentally disregards the challenges that we accept, the risks that we face, and the responsibilities that we bear willingly to bring needed energy to the world. From its inception, the oil and natural gas industry has been marked by constant change, improvement, and innovation. The enterprises that have prospered over time have understood that standing still is a great strategy for getting left behind. A company must always be improving, changing, and reinventing itself in order to survive and to thrive. And that's one reason why ExxonMobil employs more than 19,000 scientists and engineers, including 2,200 with PhDs, to drive innovation. But what is it that connects these very, very talented people? Well, I believe it's the pursuit of constant transformation that improves, upgrades, and alters, all in the service of providing better products more efficiently to our customers. Now, I think that we can all agree that innovation is critical in any industry. After all, the graveyards of capitalism are littered with companies that fail to innovate finding themselves unable to adapt to changing tastes, market conditions, or to competition. But it's not enough for us to declare to our organizations that we will innovate. It's knowing how to do so that really matters. But that is the fundamental question, how? Well, I believe the answer is found in research, which is both simple and very hard all at the same time. It's easy in the sense that anyone can see that research is necessary in order to drive innovation. After all, invention never occurs in a vacuum. But it's very hard for companies to keep up the sustained, substantive investments in research that ultimately pay off as the innovations that become vital to an enterprise's health. So think about it this way. Innovation is the lifeblood of corporate success, and that's a cliche that we've all heard, but research is what keeps the blood flowing. So let's explore ExxonMobil's history just a bit to illustrate what I mean. Rockefeller, Archibald, and the Standard Oil pioneers drove innovations in refining, transporting, and marketing petroleum products that gave form to a nascent industry. Their efforts set the standard, as the name of the company implied, for products that customers worldwide could depend upon. The strength of our commitment to innovation became evident with the outbreak of World War II. When natural rubber supplies became inaccessible, it was our researchers who responded by developing butyl rubber back in 1937. Scientists and engineers at our Baytown refinery developed the alkylation process, and they used that process to produce over a billion gallons of 100 octane aviation fuel, which was the most efficient fuel of its time. And our innovations in refining yielded more petrochemical products than ever before. In the post-war years, innovation aided the search for oil and natural gas resources to fuel the growth of the global economy. ExxonMobil's development of 3D seismic imaging in the 1960s, for instance, allowed for a more holistic visualization of the subsurface. It led to Dr. Peter Vail's revolutionary concept of seismic stratigraphy, which is now a widely adopted industry practice. And today, 
Seismic images are used to assess the age of rocks, not just their composition. And of course, this helps us to more accurately determine where oil and natural gas resources and deposits may exist. And once they're discovered, advances in reservoir simulation, which continue to improve very rapidly today, allow us to more efficiently produce these resources. ExxonMobil's innovations in drilling, both onshore and off, have allowed us to push boundaries and pursue produced res resources uh, that were once thought to simply be inaccessible. From our humble beginnings in six meters of water in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico way back in 1946, our offshore and deep water technologies have pushed modern drilling records to reach reservoirs that are hundreds of kilometers offshore and many kilometers below the seafloor. ExxonMobil drilled the first horizontal wells in the 1970s, and we've now drilled 26 of the 30 longest extended reach wells in the world. And we did it all from the, from the Yostrev drill rig in eastern Russia, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. Now, our innovations are not limited to the upstream side of our business alone. Our work further downstream has resulted in significant environmental and efficiency benefits that our customers realize and enjoy every day. For example, our better performing fuels and our lightweight plastics enable sustained solutions for reducing automobile emissions. And our early synthetics research led to new generations of Mobile One synthetic oil, raising the bar for energy saving engine performance. And some 80 years after inventing butyl rubber, ExxonMobil still remains a global leader in synthetic rubber production. And our more advanced halobutyl rubber keeps automobile tires inflated longer, saving drivers a billion gallons of fuel each and every year, and also reducing CO2 emissions by some 8 million tons every year. At the heart of each of these developments has been ExxonMobil's deep-seated commitment to research to drive innovation. From Rockefeller's day to the present time, this commitment to innovation, unmasked in our industry, has made us an energy technology leader. Each and every year, we invest approximately $1 billion in research that's aimed at driving down our costs and providing products that can earn a premium in what can only be described as a very competitive marketplace. So a sample of our current complement of technology signals an exciting future for us. Our proprietary fast drill technology has improved our drilling rates more than 80% from a decade ago, and that's resulted in a savings of $2 billion since it was developed. More efficient gas processing techniques, such as our patented CMIS technology, result in natural gas treating and processing facilities that are smaller, they're lighter, they're simpler, and they're less expensive to operate. And in the digital realm, we're using advanced analytics to help us identify opportunities and efficiencies across our entire integrated value chain. But now shifting gears, the world's growing demand for energy creates a dual challenge for us all. First, providing the energy to meet people's everyday needs. And second, doing so while managing the risks associated with climate change. And I firmly believe that ExxonMobil is making meaningful progress on both fronts. At ExxonMobil, we proudly pursue innovations to address this dual challenge. We're pioneering innovative ways to mitigate the impact from our operations. We're partnering with Fuel Cell Energy to test a novel concept for carbon capture. And we're researching biofuels from algae to create next generation motor fuels, just to name a few. All told, we've invested some $7 billion over the past 15 years towards innovative, low-emission energy solutions. Time and time again, our industry has met serious challenges head-on and delivered solutions for the benefit of society. We lit homes, and we brought cities out of the darkness in the 1800s. Then we provided motor fuels that freed people and goods to move about the world and we manufactured the plastics and the chemicals that have been described as the bricks and the mortar of contemporary civilization. 
but looking forward with a steadfast commitment to research and to innovation, our industry, our stakeholders, and the many governments that are represented here today simply must continue to make progress to address, to address the risks of climate change. And we must do so while continuing to deliver the energy that fuels economies and improves people's lives in every corner of the world. At ExxonMobil, our people are committed to doing just that. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And finally, Vakar, here you go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for giving me the chance to talk today. I hope I can contribute to the, uh, the COE sessions. Um, I, uh, since I'm uh, the only person from the uh, academia, so please allow me to uh, start with the uh, somehow like a student lecture. We start the next, oh, I can use this one. Um, we are living on the beautiful planets, the Earth, with using the huge amount of energies and also wasting the uh, chemicals and the materials. For, for making the energies and fuel, uh, materials, I try to classify four categories, as you can see on this slide. Those of which are the light, uh, originated from the energy of sunlight. The first one is the uh, biomass systems. Uh, which is a uh, rather classic, uh, traditional, but still we are using because we need the food. But also we use the food for uh, biomaterials for making the fuels and the chemicals. The second one is, I want to call it black process because uh, the materials, coal and petroleum, those have a black color. Uh, this contributions to forming uh, energies and materials are so large. But so nowadays, we are sifting to the natural gases. If you look at this trend clockwisely, uh, you will notice that the, uh, the carbon-hydrogen ratio is increasing from biomass to natural gas. Natural gas is obviously the, uh, uh, the compounds that has the highest H over C compositions among the uh, chemicals. So from this uh, uh, material uh, shift, you can expect the next future will be the uh, blue process based on hydrogens. But I don't think the everything can be done by hydrogens. We need to have uh, good combinations for those five, uh, four processes. What's the combination will be? Uh, from this figure, please carefully see the red mark part which is the uh, intermediate place. Uh, between the green and the process, we have to think about the food uh, problems. If you see the, uh, the boundary between the green process and black and white process, the, we can, these processes can share the productions of carbon-based materials. And, and between the blue and black processes, we can see think about the hydrogen economy and the energies. So that if the blue process becomes bigger and bigger, you don't have to produce a hydrogen from the black and white processes. But it's not ready. Hydrogen production from the blue process is not ready, so we have to use more and more through the black and white processes. Then, if you see that in the middles, if you have very combination, good combinations. Among the five pro processes, you'll be able to solve. You might be able to solve the CO2 emission problems in the air. So in my opinion, although the total energy consumptions and material consumption will be increased year by year, 
but the proportions of the blue and the green process may increase than the black and white processes. At the same time, I believe that the white processes will be more than the black processes. Then, what do we have to do? We can continue our uh, project many more years, but if you think about the game change for those processes, white and black, in a right, right, or in a white processes, we can ut we should utilize methane as as a, as a chemical resources for making the bulk chemicals like as ethylene or the propanes. Of course, we need to use methane as the fuels, but at the same time, we can, we can use the methane as the chemicals productions. The second one is a heavy oil. We will have a more and more heavy oils. If you have a processes to treat the heavy oils more efficiently to produce the functional chemicals like monomers, and some fine chemicals, so forth. So I would like to show you the two examples for those. The first one is methane initiatives. That has been started in Japan. I am the, uh, the, uh, the uh, chief coordinator of a methane project is in Japan. Uh, many, many professors are involved in this project. It's, but I would like to show how we do. And the second one, the, heavy, uh, the petrol mix. I will show you in detail later. As you already know, the methane initiatives, uh, there are many possible reactions that has been desired for many years, but so far, those are not, hasn't been uh, realized in the industrial scale. They are still in the, scale, in the research levels. For example, see, uh, methane pressure oxidation using molecular oxygen to CO and hydrogen, which is a desirable reaction to form hydrogen and CO, but still not easy. Most preferable reaction is the, the pressure oxidation of methane to methanol. Once you obtain the methanol, you can easily combust to other chemicals by existing processes, which is very easy. So the key step in this methane initiative is pressure oxidation of methane to methanol. That's not easy. So the, we have done, many people has done in the world to try to realize these reactions that they use the conventional research approach. We need a more strategical uh, research methods. That's the I propose the methods. As I already shown in the top, multifunctional technology as superordinate concept. In the top, funding functions from whole scientific systems by using computer systems. In the left-hand side, there are many uh, unknown functional systems, like as uh, life systems. In the right-hand side, even though you have a good ideas to make something, but if you don't have tools to make materials, then nothing happens. So we have to develop the methodologies to realize the, the concept. And the, the last one is the, uh, uh, even uh, the materials is found, you have to know what's actually is going on in the, in the materials. So we need to have more sophisticated characterization methods with this as shown in this slide. And uh, in a, for heavy oil treatment, uh, we, in Japan we studied the uh, new technology so-called petroleum as a solution. So far, the companies, in the oil company, use these kind of index as you shown, as you can see in the left top, like a sulfur content or metals content, and this the granulities or something like this. But once you know the detail of the chemical compositions of a petroleum feed, then you can re understand how to treat. Then uh, you can, if you can create the uh, uh, network reaction systems and then you can control the final product. I will show you more details. We can, uh, 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 this, this is, uh, has a three framework, the composition analysis, and the second one is the petroinformatics to uh, categorize the systems and then you can, modify, you can make a model based on the informatics. And uh, for analyzing this, we have already have uh, many good instrumentations for characterizing the each component in the heavy oils. Not perfectly, but you can 
uh, reasonably identify the compounds in the, in the materials. And using these information, we can make informatics and modeling, and you can speculate the properties. Then, finally, you can predict the reaction mechanism, network systems. Then, if, if you have a good catalytic development technologies, you can apply your technologies by not, after knowing this information, then you will be able to treat the petroleum more and more efficiently. So the catalyst and the process to optimize for any oils and any desired product. That's the ideal situation that we are doing. So uh, summary, in the summary, uh, in the methane initiatives, we would like to realize the methane reactions for chemicals using multifunctionality technologies as superordinated concept. That is most important I'd like to emphasize in this presentation. And the second one, the petroleumics, uh, new refining technologies. Once you know oneself completely or deeply, you'll be win 100%. That's the message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vataru, and thank you for sharing such a good example of what I tried to say about how new computer technologies can make uh, inways in, inroads into even, even basic uh, chemistry and even, even physics. Um, I want to return to this um, issue of knowledge and ideas and ways of working, moving between industries. Um, the the tech revolution has changed the basic valuation of companies. Today, uh, Silicon Valley companies are worth a lot more than oil and gas companies, which have dominated uh, the S&P index uh, for, for years, uh, or have been the most valuable companies in the world for years. And I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the tech revolution and the lessons you learned. Wonder a few questions that you can think about, and I think this question will, will move down. Uh, are you able to engage top scientific talent in competition with Silicon Valley type uh, industries? Um, are you inspired by them in your pursuit of radical change and speed in your R&D? Um, uh, is there something that excites you about the way of the new ways of working in-house or working with suppliers, universities, institutes, and not least, startups. And finally, does this put new demands on you in your personal role as CTO or as a professor? Those were sort of cluster of questions. Maybe you want to... <laughs> Shall I start in this end? Yeah, a question for you, for example, working with, with Petroleum, are you able to attract the best students to your institute? Uh, well, I think you have to put it a bit closer to your face. Yeah, um, uh, as i shown in this slide, if I show this kind of slides to my students, uh, this slide attract them so much, and uh, they like to embo uh, engage in the, uh, uh, the energy issues, mm -hmm. not only the petroleum, but also others. But uh, they still know that the, uh, the petroleum is a key thing. So this is always, I have to say, um, important. Yeah, I, I would imagine just working with such fantastic machines and, and doing deep science, you, you could lead the students going into any field, mm. make them exciting. Yeah. Tom, how about you? Yeah, I, you know, thanks, Alexandra. The first thing I would say is that I, I would have to acknowledge, first and foremost, that the, the competition for computational scientists is, uh, is pretty significant. Mm. And so we are in competition with Silicon Valley in industries that have very little to do with our own on the surface. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be learned from them. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, Yuri said it very well that there's some technologies that we want to keep proprietary and there's others that we want to collaborate and leverage. And so there's a lot in the computational sciences uh, space where we can collaborate with academia, with small startups, et cetera. And then there's some things that we can bring that are unique to the, uh, to the application in the sense of, of applying the physics side with the data analytics to create a business solution. So we are challenged 
to recruit uh, and compete for computational science resources, but um, the outcomes and the collaboration that we've seen when we've been receptive has been pretty remarkable. Mm. And what's your experience in Petronas? Um, I want to share my own experience, or Petronas' own experience. Uh, I think you have to case. put the microphone a bit closer uh, so they can I think it's quite okay, right? Yeah. Uh, I think they say louder. Okay. Uh, <laughs> about a year ago, when we stepped up on the gas uh, for technology, where we want everything to be fast, uh, first thing that basically came to my mind is the Silicon Valley companies. That they, they aspire me, uh, how should we treat technology? So I'm, I'm not sure how my top management respond uh, to the request when I ask that the scientists need to be paid a lot more than the engineers. Yeah? So <laughs> I, I propose a new scheme for the scientists. Uh, surprisingly, they approve it. <laughs> uh, that shows how the innovation culture need to be spur inside the company. That is one. I basically tell them that I have enough oil and gas background. I'm running away. I need a pure scientist. I need a mathematician. I need a programmer. I need a physicist. Uh, I do not need engineer's background. Yeah? Uh, that is another thing that surprised me. They approve it. Uh, another thing is that, uh, you know, Petronas is a very big corporate where uh, we have formality, you cannot wear jeans. I make the research institute free. I declare to my staff, you can come and wear jeans, I don't mind. Um, you can do whatever you want, but when you meet people, you need to dress properly. So I, I try to create environments where uh, less protocols, uh, less uh, red tapes, and a lot more innovations. Yeah? So you can have a meeting while having a picnic under the tree instead of in the, in the, in the meeting room. Uh, so that is some of the changes that uh, I'm trying to introduce inside Petronas. Uh, have a full support of the top management. I'm not sure is it, is it going to work or not, but uh, it's worth of trying. It's about a year now, but um, maybe three years' time I can tell you what's the result. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe on the question on attracting talent, what I'd like to add to all the previous speakers is um, generally we found indeed that the competition for top data scientists is, is very steep. But on the other hand, we've got quite unique problems to mm -hmm. offer that young people can work on. And, and we do find that actually a certain group of the data scientists likes to be engaged in the uh, challenge of more and cleaner energy and maybe be a little bit different from the cast of thousands that work in California mm -hmm. all on trying to sell more you know books and CDs to uh, to <laughs> consumers which is a fascinating data science problem but there's a group that likes to work on something different mm -hmm. um, so we, we can actually attract very good people and we don't need the vast numbers that maybe Amazon or, or Google need if, if we have you know, several tens, maybe a couple of hundred uh, top data scientists, they can make an enormous difference yeah. uh, to the innovation that we can bring about. So I'm quite optimistic about our industry in general to be able to leverage uh, the new scientific and technical opportunities that data science brings. Good. Um, you've all somehow touched on using ma new materials, uh, analytics, etc., to improve to improve the business, but None of you actually talked about exploration. I would imagine with so much data that analytics would be very, well, at least at the start, I thought that would be one of the areas where artificial intelligence would really have a big impact. But I haven't really seen anyone say that the machine found an idea that the humans didn't find. You want to comment on that, Tom? Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned in, in my talk, we have been working with the, the 3D seismic imaging for, for de literally decades. Mm. And so we are using high-performance computers to help us in that regard. And we continue, like many others, to work on some breakthrough technologies, some of which do include uh, human, uh, or machine learning, rather, 
to help us identify some trends. But I, I would tell you that's a difficult science. I mean, those yeah. of you that have looked at seismic lines understand that there's a lot of unique natures about those. But it's certainly an area that, um, that we think has merit and we think that it's uh, a potential place where we can leverage some of the resources that you see and that we spoke about from Silicon Valley and others. Mm. Do I might add that um, exploration might be one of those technologies where we choose to be proprietary <laughs> and in-house as that. opposed to collaborative. <laughs> uh, and therefore you may see less of it in presentations like this. Um, but we already do have experience with using data science to analyze unstructured data mm. in addition to uh, you know, previously applied uh, mathematical techniques that remain very, very important yeah. uh, in you know, seeing what you want to see in really, really complex uh, geology. So it is making its entry, uh, but we're probably not going to be entirely open about how that works. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'd like to add a few things more. Um, 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 you know, the petroleum uh, is not all chemistry, I think. It's becoming more I and more. I think you need to speak up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, so um, some people b think that uh, petroleum is not a new, new field, but I think it, it's really new. So uh, if you think about the uh, methodologies of AI or computation systems to characterize the chemicals of uh, mm -hmm. petroleum, this is totally very high quality work. Yeah. We need a very high talent people, right? So these, if you provide this kind of a situation in a study of a petroleum, young people will get attract. attract. Mm -hmm. So if you continue the classical work in a petroleum uh, uh, research, then it's not to attract young people. Yeah, but, very interesting, the, uh, to under fully understand the petroleum systems, we have to introduce the very much advanced si systems. Mm -hmm. Then this situation may attract young talent. Yeah. So uh, well, this is that's a kind of combination. I, I think you're right. In, in my organization, we've had this silo thinking where the subsurface people have been alone. And I've actually now integrating them into the group working with biotechnology and material science. Because I think there's so much sharing to be done and, and so many new um, interesting, um, interesting insights. Um, I was listening this morning to the introductions by Daniel Jurgen and uh, Mr. Poyane and how they stress this safety. You know, safety is a key core value in all, all our, uh, in, in all petroleum industry. But in addition to the high margins, the safety has also been a driver of high cost and high design. And it, it struck me that we work with uh, power grid companies and using more simulation techniques, I found that they have been able to take away large cost components from a, the field development or, or from, a, from a grid development. And I assume you're working along those same lines in, in your, in your um, projects. Yeah, this, um, I guess I don't have a question. I just felt like commenting on that. <laughs> Where I do have a question is um, several of you talked about carbon capture and some of you on storage. I think um, uh, Nasir, you talked about carbon capture from sour gas, right? To make it yeah. on spec. But do you also work on carbon capture and storage in Petronas? Yes. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia is full of uh, highly contaminated gas fields, yeah. yeah. Some of them are basically a CO2 field rather than gas fields. <laughs> uh, in order for us to unlock the value of this type of fields, uh, we, need, uh, we need a technology to handle A to Z of the whole activities, uh, coming from uh, productions, transportation, separation, circulation, and, and everything. In fact, one of the things that I believe, uh, strongly believe, is converting the waste to value effort. Uh, in that part of the region, CO2 has always been seen as a problem, uh, always been seen as something that at cost, something being seen that enemy. Yeah? Uh, as, as, a, as a head of technology in Petronas, I, I want to treat it differently. I want to take that as an opportunity for us to convert uh, or to add values to CO2. So I put up a lot of programs and effort and money uh, in that types 
converting CO2 to ethanol, uh, to methane, methanols. And one of the programs that currently doing is basically uh, to further enhance our, our marbles mm. uh, by restructuring the, the, the carbon and the uh, oxygens uh, inside the carbons, we can get a very high quality uh, carbonate that mm. we can sell at higher price. So uh, I, I believe that is a key. We need to convert anybody that hate us, doesn't like us, to be our friends. Uh, that is how I see things. But if you convert it to natural gas, I mean, it, there will still be emissions, right? Oh, and yeah, I, yeah. And uh, I think Yuri's point about the net, net zero, uh, that's part of the Paris Agreement, that from yes. in the second uh, half of the century, there will be net no emissions. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that would, you somehow would need to store and, and bring totally clean fuels to the yeah. table, wouldn't you? That's, that's, that's why we have to, to, to handle this from a multiple angles, uh, different perspective. Mm. Uh, sequestration will still going on. Uh, converting it to solid mm. uh, and, and add and use it and permanent capture it into that solid is one of the things, big agenda inside Petronas mm. uh, CO2 programs. Uh, I, I do not see that uh, one technology can basically solve or become a silver bullet to these issues. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a combination of technology. Yes, we want to make money, but not at the expense of environment. So net uh, CO2 must be, must be, must be negative. That, so that is the vision that we are having. I wanted to ask you, Yuri, because you talked about hydrogen for transportation, this uh, German initiative. And I think many people would argue <coughs> that the personal car industry is sort of lost to the batteries. Uh, the, the, some people would argue that. Uh, I mean, not from either it's oil or it's batteries, whereas hydrogen for personal cars is, seems like a, a struggle to, to win over once, once the battery car is in, whereas you have all the natural gas uses in industrial processes, in heating and cooking, etc. Are you also working on ways of bringing hydrogen into those value chains because you need to do it before it's electrified somehow. Yeah, L like most people who study this question, we don't believe that there is a single technology solution for the whole challenge. It's just too complicated. Uh, in the previous panel on the refining and downstream, we heard all the analysis that tells us that mobility will continue to go up. Therefore, energy consumption for mobility will sure. continue to go up and so will materials consumption. Therefore, we need to find alternative ways of you know, getting that CO2 back out of the system for those sectors that are just very unlikely to find a non-fuels-based solution. Uh, and, and I spoke about steel manufacture mm -hmm. and aviation as some of the most challenging ones. Um, we see carbon capture and utilization as one of the potential mm -hmm. pathways, clearly a more uh, attractive to an economy uh, than, than sequestration. But of course, from a technical perspective, sequestration is much nearer in, in, in time. Basically, given societal will and uh, an economic driver with pricing, it can be done today. Uh, whereas most utilization solutions require quite some uh, scientific breakthrough mm. uh, to make you know, a real significant difference. We know about using CO2 for uh, for NRL soil recovery, but that's relatively small volumes. Uh, if you'd want to make a big impact with utilization, you'll have to be able to convert CO2 into some sort of bulk material for construction or back into a fuel, and th this is difficult. Um, you asked about hydrogen specifically. I agree that in many countries for relatively light duty vehicles, the switch to battery electric can be made fairly soon. Mm. Um, but for uh, heavy duty transport, sure. or even for you know, big personal vehicles, uh, batteries are still quite a challenge, whereas hydrogen can offer a, uh, at least a, a zero tailpipe solution uh, much quicker. The big hurdle that hydrogen has to overcome is you need a new uh, infrastructure in a country. 
a whole new distribution system because there's a chicken and egg between switching to another driver and, and being able to, to source it. Hence what we're doing in Germany to mm. see whether that makes a difference. I would argue that if countries make the switch to a hydrogen economy, and for instance Japan is, is looking seriously into this, because they want a solution for heavy duty mobility, uh, light duty mobility may actually then switch back because once you have an infrastructure, it's conveniently available, uh, a three minute full charge time uh, and you know a, a large radius until you have to re refill again is actually quite an attractive proposition mm -hmm. to a consumer. But it probably would have to go via heavy duty mobility that, that countries say, I, I wanna make that switch. I talk, to, I talk to players in the power industry, let's say that in Europe by 2045, it can be a virtually fossil-free power system, including all that um, energy that's today used for heating and cooking, which is in a way a threat to natural gas as a, as a, as a product. So I was wondering, do you do anything in, in uh, domestic infrastructure, uh, refitting gas pipelines, et cetera? Is that, is that a part of your work? Well, let, let me just kind of build on the discussion that we had in, in the past segment and, and link it to this. I think you first have to understand the, the origin of the question. I mean, what are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Well, society is telling us very clearly that, um, that we need to head towards a lower carbon world. Mm -hmm. That's a given. Now there's a whole host of ways to accomplish that very task. And so I mentioned in, in my talk that we're working um, with fuel cell energy on carbon capture. Yeah. We've been working on carbon storage, carbon sequestration, uh, the use of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery for, for decades. But let's just stop and take a step back. If you want to reduce the amounts of CO2 um, that, is, that are in the atmosphere or that, or that are emitted, the first thing you can do in the most cost effective way is to improve the fuel efficiency of the conventional automobiles that are on the road. Sure. There's no question about that. The second most efficient thing that you can do from a cost perspective is to transition from methane, I'm sorry, from coal to methane gas, particularly in the electrification world, right? And so if you look at ExxonMobil's energy outlook for through 2040, you'll note that the OECD countries are gonna decline in their CO2 emissions over the next mm -hmm. 23 years. And a lot of that is due to the fuel transitions that I'm talking about. Now, it's not lost on me that you have a, a lot of, of very real social challenges in some countries where coal is, is, is the selected fuel for cost reasons. So I'm not naive to that fact. But if, if you're really focused on reducing CO2, those are the top two things that you can do. The next thing, the next step, and it's a big step, uh, involves carbon capture and sequestration, solar, and wind. Sure. And so those are big steps. And, and, and as Yuri said, and, and, and Nasser as well, there's not a single answer to this. So we've got to continue to, to perform our research around carbon capture and storage. We've got to continue work in the hydrogen world. We, we've got to attack this problem from many, many different angles. Have you made any estimates of how, how much you can scale up your biofuel from algae? I think that's a very interesting concept. Yeah, so we, we, as, you, as you probably read in, in the last few weeks, thanks for mentioning that, we, we have seen a bit of a breakthrough where we've seen the, the amount of, of biofuels that can be generated at the laboratory scale um, increase uh, relative to what we had originally anticipated. The trick with algae has always been the scale-up challenge. And Cultivation so methods and harvesting methods. You're and, exactly yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by what we've seen in the laboratory, um, but you know, there's a reason we call things like these breakthrough technologies. It takes many years, if not decades, mm -hmm. to take them from laboratory successes into something that can be applied at scale. Mm. Well, Yuri, I, I wanted to ask you about, you, you showed your collaboration with the Kite Wind Company and a few other l breakthroughs long-term. How, how do you select the ones you go for? Um, like in, uh, in, in any professional research organization, uh, we, we apply funnel thinking Mm -hmm. um, so starting off with screening lots and lots and lots of ideas and um, dedicating relatively small amounts of funds to each and then see how they progress, um, whether they, uh, they, they make the progress that we had hoped 
uh, and then before you start to commit more serious amounts of money to any particular idea, switch off enough other ones that you can redirect the funds to. In a way, with uh, working with incubators and startups, it's not different, although it's not work that you do in your own lab. Mm -hmm. uh, we start off screening lots of ideas, uh, look at the basic techno-economics of the idea, do some, some basic checks around, is this even thermodynamically possible and things like that. I'm sure mm -hmm. all my colleagues get lots of uh, emails like I do about people wanting to sell us a perpetuum and mobile. So there's a basic first check around the, 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 the essentials. And then you start to whittle it down. Mm. Um, and, then, uh, and then when it's a relatively short list, we start to seriously investigate companies, maybe audit, et cetera, before we, before mm. we invest. It just struck me when I prepared for this session that some of your competitors have gone into more already scaled up uh, renewables, fighting in wind and solar, where the landscape is full of private equity and startups and, and other industries, whereas um, ExxonMobil and Shell seem to have now focusing more on very long-term R&D related issues. And thought, I thought that would be interesting to hear your choices around that. Well, we do both. Uh, I'll let Tom uh, comment on Exxon, but <coughs> we, uh, we invest also in offshore wind mm. um, together with, with partners. Mm. Uh, based on technology that is available today, and then the innovation is more in how you develop the project, construct it, finance mm -hmm. it, etc., rather than in the core technology which is available, um, and various routes to biofuels, etc., which are relatively near term, as well as longer term solutions, and mm -hmm. yeah, the longer term solutions can make a bigger impact, and it's, it's, uh, it's possible that you really find a proprietary niche which you wouldn't have if you only do uh, project developments based on what is available in the market today. Mm -hmm. So we do both, basically. Okay. Okay. I wanted to end the session by talking a little bit about this shift between the supplier industry or the su supplier industry suddenly having huge mergers with Schlumberger taking steps in their value chain, Technip FMC, GE Baker, etc. And, and I think making a play on life of field services and the internet of things, being able to see across their portfolio. Do you, um, you commented a little bit on that, Yuri, on how you try to keep a competitive playing field at the same time working collaboratively. And I wondered if any of you others would want to share some thoughts on how you see the shift in R&D responsibility and innovation capabilities between yourselves and your suppliers. Uh, perhaps I can start. Uh, uh, Petronas is quite unique because we have two hats. One as a, as a host authority and the other one as an oil operator. So we have, we, 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 we bear uh, both hats at the same time, same, same place. Uh, one of the issues in Petronas is that, especially in, in, in Malaysia, if, if we try to do everything, there will be no service company exists in Malaysia. Uh, we're going, basically going to conquer the whole thing. So what I believe that is not a good model to approach. Uh, so what, what we did is that uh, we subdivide our technology into several categories. The first one is what we call operational excellence uh, technology. This is, this, is, this is a technology that we need it now and Petronas uh, do not intend to develop it, and we want to position Petronas as all, all, all companies in Malaysia as a user. So we want the solutions today. We basically uh, approach the whole system through crowdsourcing. So anybody, if you, if you log on to petronas.com.my, uh, uh, there is one crowdsourcing, and we put up a technology challenge uh, to the whole world. So anybody can submit any proposal for Petronas to evaluate. Uh, that is how we, we, we want to work so that uh, uh, the service provider can inculcate the culture of innovation as well uh, inside their companies. It, it is not only uh, the all companies have to do that. So we have coexist hmm. symbiosisly uh, so that the whole industry can, can grow. 
uh, we believe that the difficult one should be handled by the oil companies. Uh, <laughs> something that is a, a little bit longer term, uh, where the payment, say if the service company do that, they might not get the return uh, because they have to wait until the issues come on. So that, that things we handle it ourselves. Uh, so we divide jobs and uh, we make our role and responsibility clear to everybody in the industry, uh, especially in Malaysia. Okay, yeah. thank you. Tom? So I, I guess what I would suggest is that we separate this in, into three buckets. And so there's the bucket that I would suggest to you is really more technology, it's not research. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's a significant role for service companies in the area of technology development and application. Where technology becomes a commodity, we should leverage it as a commodity. And we look for opportunities to do just that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second area I wanna talk about is, is partnerships with, with academia. And so we spend a great deal of time uh, matching the, um, the, the fundamental scientists that we have at, at our corporate strategic research with um, individuals at various in, uh, academic institutions to advance some very deep thinking, some very far out um, and breakthrough types of technological ideas. We, we do that for two reasons. Number one, it, it helps us to, um, to marry up some unique and additive skills that we have within our company with some true subject matter experts within academia. So that's very helpful. And then the third area are things that, uh, as Yuri and I have both mentioned, are proprietary in nature, that we mm -hmm. keep close to the vest. And so we'll leverage third parties to help us advance some things, but there's a lot, particularly if it involves the subsurface, that we're gonna hold pretty, pretty close to the chest. And so because of that, you know, the way that I think about running our research business really goes into those three categories. I want to multiply the efforts of our organization but I also want to be sure that we make the best of our unique and additive roles within ExxonMobil. Okay, great. Father, have you seen any shifts in how you ac interact with industry uh, well, lately? Uh, well, I told you in my lectures, we have to set the uh, superordinate concept first. Super, I'm oh, sorry, uh, superordinate concept first. If mm -hmm. you, once you s start set the uh, uh, superordinate concept, then it, these kind of things attract many people, not only the academia, but also industry people. Mm. Then we can start the very tight collaboration works in the directions of the superordinate concept. Then, for example, in, uh, in a CEO capturing, for example, um, you know, if you simply uh, stress decrease the CO2 emission, that doesn't work. It's, it's not a good superordinate concept. Mm -hmm. But if you utilize mm -hmm. this some, some sort of uh, petroleum compounds to capture the CO2 efficiently, then the, the petroleum itself can capture the CO2. Mm -hmm. this ki if you set this kind of superordinate concept, you give people get together and bring in something new. It also attracts the young people, also attract the uh, top persons in the uh, company, I guess. I get excited when you, you, know, when you speak. That's great. Yeah. Listen, we have only a few minutes left. I want to leave you to make a short closing statement, if you wish. Shall we start with you, Tom, since Wataru just talked? Well, I, <laughs> oh, you want to start? Okay. <laughs> well, um, how to say? Um, 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 uh, I always think that I'm, uh, of course, in the coming from the academia, I'm very much interested in the uh, basic science, so um, I'm not the right person to comment on this kind of thing, but um, um, uh, I, I want to use the uh, petroleum of many, 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 many years for forever. Thank you. That's my... Thank you. Yeah. So I, I guess I would begin by just stating that, that I believe that, that we work, we're very fortunate to work in a wonderfully complex business. And so we have a number of challenges facing our industry um, that are very unique to our industry. You know, we believe with ExxonMobil that we have a, an obligation of sorts to be sure that um, we manage through energy poverty, that, that everybody across the world, regardless of where they live, where they were born, have the, um, the same access to energy that we're so blessed with in, in the West. Um, at the same time, we have some very uh, uh, significant social responsibilities to manage things like climate change and and to move in a direction of, of a lower carbon world. And it's gonna take a lot of very smart scientists to, to get uh, some of these, these tough challenges 
um, overcome. So I, I, I want to go back to the people pieces of this. Um, I, I really think that we have a wonderful opportunity to excite young people coming out of university, to help them feel as if they can be part of something that's bigger than themselves and, and be more than just a contributor to a bottom line. They can help us with some of these fundamental objectives that we talked about earlier on. Thank you. Um, uh, technology, you know? technology is destructive in nature. Uh, we like it or we don't like it, it will happen. Uh, so it's better if we plan it properly, uh, we predict it properly, uh, and it's better if the destructions come from us rather than, rather than other industry disrupt us <laughs> and make us not relevant to this, uh, to this, to this world. And uh, this is where collaborations, Congress like this is one of the place for us to exchange view and opinion. Good. Very good. Yeah, I mean, similar to Tom, uh, I speak a lot to, to young people thinking about whether they want to join this industry as a scientist, and what I say to them is, uh, with the world going from a little over 7 billion people today to 9 to 10 by the middle of the century, billions of people wanting to escape out of poverty and into the middle classes, and fundamental thermodynamics telling you that a lot of energy will be needed for that. If you combine that with the challenge of switching the energy system to something that is different than what we have today, we're probably going to see more change in the energy system in the next 20 to 30 years than we've seen in the last 50, in, at least in terms of composition. Um, that is a tremendously exciting uh, world uh, to live in and a uh, problem to work on. On top of that, the science is really, really cool in this industry. So if you're a young scientist, <laughs> and you have the ability to go and work on something that deeply matters to the world and is really cool, where else would you want to work? So, you know, You're right. all opportunity. If everything was simple, you wouldn't want to be there, would you? Absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, uh, look at the audience. They stayed here at this late stage of the day. I think that is a testament to your inspiring talks and that we've been covering a lot of ground, and I thank you very much for participating in this uh, round table. Thank you. Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research established this research center, which is the Petroleum Research Center, with the aim to make it a regionally recognized center of excellence uh, in both upstream and downstream technologies. The main purpose of this center actually is to serve the oil sector and to be the R&D arm uh, uh, you know, of the petroleum uh, industry in Kuwait. It has a foundation. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first in the region. It was started in 1967. So it has uh, a fairly amount of maturation. The development of technologies in different areas is a continuous process. Why you develop every time? Because there is a need, there is a requirement, there is a way that you have to find a cost-effectiveness uh, technology, uh, impressed technology which can fulfill your requirement. There is enormous challenges uh, that the petroleum industry uh, is facing and those uh, challenges definitely need innovative answers. We are concentrating on how to improve the reserved oil in, in the country, how, uh, how we can probably develop technologies to improve the, uh, the recovery. In this center, we have five types of programs. Each program is focused in one area in the field. First program, we call it Enhance or Recovery. Enhance or Recovery means their work is totally with the upstream. The reservoir is the more uh, complex part of the earth geology. And as we go to deeper and more difficult oil, we need more understanding. This way we will enhance our capability of producing at lower costs. If we develop a technology which has to do related to enhance oil recovery, increasing the production, 
Uh, this technology, of course, can be used in any other country, in the GCC countries or in the world, uh, based on how much effective is this technology. Another two programs, we call one of them optimization refining processes, and we have a refining capacity flexibility. These two programs under the uh, downstream process. This program particularly deals with the hydro processing. Hydro processing means you treat the petroleum fraction in the presence of the catalyst and the hydrogen. We uh, have a number of patents related to the spent catalyst in, where, in which we try to develop a technology to recover the metals as well as to reuse this, uh, this spent catalyst. This can be used everywhere if it is acceptable and then commercialized. We are very good in catalysis monitoring. Also, we have now for producing the catalyst as well. We preparing of the catalyst evaluation, and also we are doing it in our labs. We have here a very a unique lab. We call it pilot plant, which is simplified from the refinery. We try to align our research activities with the requirement needed by KNPC, and at the same time. Uh, having this facility, which, which I'm talking now here, uh, is give us the opportunity because this consider a small refinery, which is mimicking the real refinery. It's operational 24 hours. So if we target a certain specific product, so we can make a full study, giving the results upon the completion of the results, giving it to, to the client, namely KNPC, there is a, a great potential to they use it on the commercial units. It's important because uh, the, the refinery and all the technology are changing with the years, okay, in order to take account of the environment. Uh, but more you take account of the environment, you reduce the gain of the refinery. You have to maintain your gain uh, respecting the environment. Because of this, we are developing this technology that they are taking account of all these elements. Petroleum refining, you are processing specific uh, feedstock, but this is feedstock also properties is changing. So you need to develop catalyst. As the property changes, the sulfur content, for example, the sulfur content is increasing. So what technology that you have to use in order to reduce the sulfur to be accepted uh, worldwide so the people they can buy your, your uh, commodity or your product uh, which is meeting the uh, international standards. So the demand for technology development is always there. Fourth one, which is the corrosion, corrosion assessment and mitigation. And here it's falling into two areas, which is downstream and upstream, and to prevent any kind of failures happens in the future. Cost of corrosion for the oil industry is in millions. Imagine a simple failure in a refinery, a crack in a vessel or a pipe or a reactor. It means for the refinery shutdown of a unit and uh, they take several days to change the uh, damaged uh, piece of equipment. So you lose production for several days. The last one which will be petrochemicals. In our program, we are focused on enhancing the product properties and we are focusing as well on trying to engineer high performance uh, polymers. In these two uh, solutions, we can help the, the, the sector to be more competitive in comparison with the market and international market products. There are many, many technologies worldwide, but uh, which technology would suit uh, the reservoir that you have? Imagine in, uh, in, uh, not only each country has uh, its own uh, oil uh, properties, but each well, each well, the, it has its own characteristics. So in this case, you have to really look into technology to produce what we call it, this type of uh, crude oil, which is under category of non-conventional oil recovery. That's why we introduced the improved oil recovery, the enhanced oil recovery, to produce the heavier feedstock. We're also uh, responsible to have uh, staff to be well-skilled and trained, Kuwaiti staff in particular, also having students from university, from public authority, to, 
to having their, uh, for example, their thesis or something like that. So we, we work collaboratively with those uh, affiliation in order to, uh, to end up with high caliber uh, staff that can, can not only be used at Kisar, but also in the oil sector. We have to really be ready and confident in, in, in our research projects that we conduct and uh, also uh, to be highly recognized and acknowledged uh, uh, for, for the science and technology and innovation uh, locally, regionally and internationally. I think the needs require such institute to exist not only in Kuwait and the region but all over the world because energy uh, is uh, one of the main factors that uh, impact uh, sustainability. We have a fantastic team, we have a marvelous equipment under one roof, so it is a really a platform to start directional uh, research in all kinds. The vision is clear now, uh, based on the, this close relationship that we have, now it's getting more and clearer and clearer to us exactly how to, where to focus and how to probably achieve these uh, this, uh, plans that we, we set.